Hi, I'm Richard Zussman, CBC's legislative reporter. Thank you so much for joining us for this special Facebook Live. We are just 15 minutes away from the final debate between the leaders for this BC provincial election, and it is the only primetime TV debate. Now, let me say hello to Elise Mills, a former BC Liberal strategist, Bill Thielman, a former NDP strategist. So a lot at stake. These TV debates are big time. Elise, what's at stake tonight for BC Liberal leader Christy Clark? I think uh, Christy Clark has to be able to uh, be able to concisely talk about her success record on jobs. She has to be able to highlight John Horgan's weaknesses, which I think is his temperament, uh, some choices, some character choices that he's made, especially with the involvement of the U.S. Steelworkers union and then she needs to be able to thread th th that needle all the way back to the softwood lumber big trade disputes it's not just about softwood lumber it's about wine it's about blueberries it's about water it's been about a million things and she needs to be able to show that BC needs that strong consistent leadership we will be taking your questions we'll be on here for about 14 or so more minutes right up until the debate starts at 6 30 so send them away please in the comment section and we will get to those questions but bill what's at stake tonight for ndp leader john horgan john horgan has to prosecute the case against premier christy clark he has to make this a referendum about christy clark in this election and that's really what he's been trying to do and so he has to go out there and talk about housing affordability he has to talk about her weak points health care education and he has to also make sure that he doesn't leave some space open for andrew weaver the green leader to possibly vote split and cause a situation where the greens take enough votes not to win very many seats but to actually uh, allow the Liberals to sneak back in. So you mentioned the final guy in the debate, Green Party leader Andrew Weaver, a little bit different than it was four years ago when we had the BC Conservatives also in the debate. So with a third in there, and, and the, the Greens have been polling quite well, I'll start with you, Elise. What do you think Andrew Weaver needs to do tonight, I guess in part to introduce himself to British Columbians, but also convince them that the Greens are a viable option? Well, I think he's got a couple of hurdles to jump. Um, this particular narrative that's happening within the campaign right now on softwood lumber, resource development, jobs, and how that all weaves together on a social, the social issues, that's going to be difficult for Andrew Weaver because he's coming from a green platform. One of his key supporters is David Suzuki. So how do you defend softwood lumber when the ultimate position for greens has been to be against resource development. It'll be interesting to see if he's able to perform that what I call the 2.5 political flip there and be able to bring back some policy that I think the majority of uh, British Columbians uh, can reasonably get behind, right? Yeah, because his platform was filled with <coughs> lots of big ideas, ideas yeah. on education, transit. Uh, of all the platforms, it was the most ambitious. Bill, many people <laughs> will remember, I guess ambitious comes with the price tag Because too. it's the least possibly <laughs> likely to happen. But so. there are a lot of big ideas. Mm -hmm. Clearly, many people remember, I guess less now than they used to, the 91 debate. When mm -hmm. Gordon Wilson emerged as a third party and the Liberals became mm -hmm. relevant. And now, look, they've been in yeah. power for 16 years. So mm -hmm. what is there any... Thing that Andrew Weaver can do, do you think, to create a Gordon Wilson moment tonight? It's very hard to do. It's also obviously staged, and Gordon Wilson's <laughs> was staged, right. actually. But it's a very different situation because social credit was collapsing at that point, and neither the NDP nor the BC Liberals are collapsing. So, uh, or at least as far as we know, certainly from the last polls, which uh, the Li BC Liberals might have a worry. I think he's got to kind of work a very difficult line because he's pulling votes from both parties, despite what people say that the NDP lose more votes to the to the uh, Greens. The Greens are also pulling a lot of votes from Liberals, and, and Andrew Weaver's own seat was stolen from the Liberals. So uh, that's the kind of thing he's got to work a different line on both of them. He can, if he stands off like he did in the last, uh, the radio debate that happened, he could have a problem as well because he really was a non-entity in that one. And he's going to have more time and it's a more structured debate today. But he also has a tendency, as you know, from being in Victoria, he's a bit of an academic wonk and he can go on and on and on uh, mm -hmm. on some things. And if he does that, that's not good debate style. No, and he's had some pretty substantial training this time around. Also important to note to people, this is a very different debate than what what they may have seen last week in the radio debate. This is, yeah. uh, the podiums are far apart. They can't touch each other. I'm allowed to do that, right? <laughs> yes, you uh, can. <laughs> they, so they can't touch each other. They can't talk over each other because yeah. their mics will be cut off pretty mm -hmm. quickly. So a lot of that comes into play with the sort of style. And so it will benefit Andrew Weaver because I don't think he does. He's, um, he's he feels sort of, uh, it, 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 
native to the environment of that fast-paced cut and thrust that John Horgan and both and Christy Clark are, feel very comfortable yeah. and confident. And more experience. And, and also, too. those are two street fighters. I mean, John Horgan and Christy Clark, they go back many years. I mean, <laughs> any of us that have been in politics, uh, you know, have known John Horgan, known Christy Clark. I mean, that, their reputation precedes them. They're both excellent uh, debaters. Uh, Andrew Weaver, this is the first litmus test for him, whether or not he can quickly, succinctly execute um, his narrative around policy, answer some questions, be able to defend and also attack. I, I think he's a, a brilliant guy, he's in, highly intelligent, but it doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be able to do well on that particular stage. Elise says, Bill, people know John Horgan in politics, but one of the big issues for this campaign has been whether British Columbians know John Horgan. Mm -hmm. A lot of them will meet him tonight. Mm -hmm. How important is that first impression, and do you still feel like name recognition is an issue for him? Well, I think it's obviously, you, you can look at the polls and see what they say, but pretty obviously, John Horgan and the NDP are about 10 points ahead in the latest poll. So uh, a lot of people are saying, I, I, I like what I see, I like what I've seen so far. And part of it is the NDP platform, which is really focusing on some key issues for British Columbians, the top issues, housing affordability, health care, education. And so when we see the and accountability and integrity in government, uh, the whole pay-for-play politics piece. So I think that's part of the, the message that he has to get across and he also has to say look you can trust me I can run this province uh, Premier Christie Clark can't trust uh, run this province Andrew Weaver isn't going to be running this province so it's a pretty simple message in that way but uh, easy to say harder to get across please send in your questions we'd love to hear from you watching the Facebook live what do you want to see tonight what are you looking for what are the issues that matter to you what would make somebody the winner tonight ask away let us know what you think and what you're expecting tonight and we'll do our best to discuss those issues so please fire off your questions in the comment section right below the video and we'll get to as many of those as possible elise is there a way for there to be a winner and a loser in a debate like this and you know how do people decide i guess when they're watching at home or watching online who the winner or loser may be well, we reference or you reference the 91 debate, which was sort of this coming out moment for Gordon Wilson and the B.C. Liberals, uh, which was a relatively, uh, it, at that point, it was a party that was emerging on the breakdown of the social credit party, right? Um, this, as we saw in 2013, though, and was we were sitting here doing the same, uh, <laughs> same commentary, we didn't actually see a natural winner come out of the 2013 leaders debate. So it then becomes the battle the next day of the press, like who's gonna get their press release out there and lay the claim that they won. Uh, but hopefully tonight, I think with John Horgan versus the Adrian Dix uh, debate of uh, four years ago, I think tonight John Horgan and Christy Clark will have one of, the, I think, uh, an impressive, uh, fiery debate. And there are gonna be a ton of moments uh, for one of the leaders to be able to take a winner's position and back their opponent in to the corner. Uh, Richard Zussman, legislative reporter for the CBC, Elise Mills, former BC Liberal strategist, Bill Thielman, former BC NDP strategist. Thank you for joining us for this special Facebook Live pregame show before the debate. We're about seven or eight minutes away and both of you have been in positions where you would get candidates ready for debates like this. Bill, walk me through uh, what is going on right now as these leaders get ready for this debate. Well, this will just be calm down as much as you possibly can, all three leaders. It's a very tense situation. Um, you, anytime you've been in, and I, I was with Premier Glenn Clark, the amount of pressure you're under is phenomenal. So you have to just shake it off. These are people who have obviously performed in front of crowds, in front of legislature, in front of TV, but this is different and there's no way you can get around that. So you just want to keep your your leader as calm as possible, have, make sure they're well hydrated, well fed. Uh, you don't want to try and jam them with facts and figures at the last minute and try and over program because that can really cause uh, havoc with a leader. So you want to just basically maintain an era of calm, uh, air of calm all around the environment there and then um, and then just pump them up and get them going. And I think, you know, that's what's going on. Before that though, you've had hours and hours of debate prep, you've had mock debates, you've had people uh, playing the other opposing uh, uh, roles in those debate moments and you try all the questions out that you think the panel will come up with. Uh, Jennifer Burke, the host, will obviously throw out some surprise questions. Yep. So they're trying to prepare for the surprise questions, so they're not surprised. And that'll be also very interesting. There's a lot goes into it. There are some great questions. I was part of the team that got to put them together. Oh, so, there, the so there will be some good ones. Um, 
so we have some questions. Thank you so much for those online who are following along. Uh, Trevor Chang wants to know, how would you summarize each party's platforms for people who don't know anything about politics? So Trevor, just let me start. We'll get in. You'll get a sense over the next hour and a half what these people stand for. But at least very simply go through the, the liberal platform for me uh, and summarize it for Trevor. Okay, the top line issues with the BC Liberal Party is talking about the work that's been done on bringing uh, British Columbia back to Canada's number one economy. Where this harkens back to is that during the NDP years, uh, BC was last in all the provinces. This was a place that people were running from. They weren't uh, investing here. There weren't jobs for young people. There really wasn't a lot to hang on to. It has been an absolute renaissance for British Columbia. For the first time ever, this province leads economically and it will be carrying the load for our sisters and brothers in Alberta and Saskatchewan, especially Alberta who is still struggling uh, to, uh, to regain their economic momentum. There's a lot of pressure from Ottawa down to uh, uh, Christy Clark to be able to maintain this economic uh, uh, success. There's also the idea of, so now we have 200,000 plus jobs that are being created. What's the next step? Now it's time to feed back into the social agenda and what can we do there? I think a big marquee piece has, has been uh, the, the plan around education as well. Uh, the idea that we actually do have one of the best healthcare systems in the country. Um, and I think, uh, I, I think it's the idea of yes, continuing on the progress, but also then pivoting a bit and looking at what we can do in the social sector as well. So Trevor, you see there's a lot and yeah. I think at least bored a page out of that book Sorry. you were talking about earlier. Sorry. It sounded like a talking point to me. So tell me what then the bottom line is for what John Horgan will be selling tonight. Well, pretty clearly what he's talking about. And, and let's say that, I mean, we agree, the, B, the BC economy is the best. Uh, I mean, it's been 16 years. There's been periods where it was the worst, too, under Gordon Campbell and the Liberals. So, but more precisely, we don't see the benefits. We see health care, emergency rooms overflowing, people being forced out of emergency rooms or waiting long times. We see housing affordability out of control, not just here in Metro Vancouver, but in Victoria, Kelowna, and other areas. We see problems with all sorts of user fees, MSP fees going up, hydro, ICBC. So John Horgan is saying we have to make BC more affordable. We we have to share the benefits of a good economy and do more for people, ordinary folks, and not for the Christy Clark, uh, the big business, the wealthy, who have done quite well under this government, but for everybody. And, and you know, enough of the $20,000 plate dinners with corporate donors and all the other pay-for-play politics that have been going on. I think integrity and accountability of government is one of the major issues in this election as well. What Andrew Weaver will do is he'll weigh in on many of those issues you mentioned in terms of fundraising and corruption within the BC Liberals that Weaver will bring forward and then he'll also talk about how the BC NDP in opposition did nothing that was inspiring. We heard that in his closing statement during the radio debate. Uh, the Green Party is trying to focus on doing politics differently and trying to sort of enter the conversation uh, but at this point still a quite new party and, and the goal for him tonight will be to introduce himself to people. We have a few more questions and please we only have a few minutes left so if you have some questions, final questions you want to get in, I just want to remind you after the debate we'll be doing a post game show with Dan Burrett along with Elise and Bill so there'll be an opportunity for more questions then. Um, Raymond wants to know, and we talked about this a little bit earlier at the beginning, about uh, vote splitting and how much that may come into play. Uh, Bill, uh, quickly, what do you think, how big a factor could it be in this election? Well, every third party, in this case the Green Party, gets squeezed in an election wherever it is because you get two major parties who are fighting out to form government and the third party gets squeezed at the end. And people say, well, you know, I really would like to vote for the third party or I, or I think the third party might be a good choice, but it's going to allow the party that I really don't like to win. And so that's the challenge for any third party. It doesn't matter who you are or what your politics are. And that's the challenge the Greens will have. If they somehow are continuing to, to rise, then people will look, and it's in our electoral system, it's riding by riding, it's not across the province. So uh, voters who are going to have to look very carefully if they want to elect a liberal or they want to elect a conservative or they want to elect, either, I guess there's 10 conservatives, they want to elect a new democrat or a green, they have to look very closely within their own riding. And in some ridings, uh, I mean in most ridings, it's impossible to elect a green. Uh, in a few, I think it is, and that will be part of the battleground area. Mm -hmm. and, and do you think this is a major factor that, that goes into their heads in a debate? Does, do you think about things like vote splitting? What, what, do, <laughs> oh, yeah. you, what do you focus <laughs> in on? What is your last, we have a minute left here before mm -hmm. we have to throw over to the debate. Mm -hmm. So if you're in one of those rooms with a candidate, mm -hmm. what are you telling them? What's the last thing you say to them on if, their way out the door? Uh, so to be fair to the Green Party who doesn't have someone sitting here right yeah. now, I'll play devil's advocate. I'll be Andrew Weaver's uh, strategist or comms person. You've got about 45 seconds so to I'll do it. So I'll say this. 
He has a huge opportunity to split with the NDP because one thing the NDP's got, which is a liability, absolutely for sure, is the leader. The leader, I think Andrew Weaver, uh, comes across more pleasant. I think it's more, the voters find him more um, likable, favorable. And he's got those strong, very clear and precise green policies where you're not really sure where Horgan's going to go. He's stuck between the two tribes in his party, labor and, and environment. Thank you. Sorry. Please, Bill. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in, and it's now time for what you've all waited for, the primetime TV debate, the last time you'll see the leaders square off. Thanks for joining us. We are on a roll and we want to keep rolling. We want to make sure that British Columbia continues to grow. The BC Greens know that we can collectively prosper while sustaining this beautiful place. My commitment is to do everything I possibly can each and every day, and the people of this province deserve nothing less than that. Good evening, and welcome to the BC Leaders Debate 2017. I'm Jennifer Burke, and I will be your moderator for this evening's debate. And with just on two weeks left in the campaign, there's a lot on the line for everyone tonight, so settle in. I'm pleased to be joined by the leaders of BC's three major political parties. We have the Liberals, Christy Clark, the Greens, Andrew Weaver, and John Horgan from the NDP. Welcome to you all. Now, we will be getting underway in just a moment, but I do want to take a little bit of time to explain how the next 90 minutes will unfold. We will begin with opening statements in just a moment. We've consulted with some of the top political observers in the province to formulate questions tailored to each specific leader. There will be a portion of the debate where the leaders will have a chance to question and debate each other on three major themes and other hot topics. And there are, of course, questions from average British Columbians. Now, we are going to be observing some strict rules of order. There are time sequences, and we are using a countdown clock. If a leader goes over the allotted time, their mic will be cut. There will be time for free debate between leaders. But to be very clear, and to avoid talking over each other, we've decided only two leaders will be allowed to debate at a time. This was a format that was agreed to by the political parties and by the members of the broadcast consortium. So, let's get underway. The order of the evening has been prearranged in a draw with all the parties, and opening remarks will be one minute in length each. Going first is the NDP's John Horgan. Mr. Horgan, you have the floor. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to those viewers who are turning in tonight. In this election, you have a clear choice. Four more years of government that's working for the people at the top, or a government that's working for you. Over the past number of years, life's been getting more difficult. You're working harder, but you're not getting ahead. Medical services premiums keep going up. Hydro rates keep going up. Housing costs are out of control. The services that you count on aren't there for you when you need them, and the jobs that we counted on are disappearing, and they're being replaced by low-wage, part-time work. I don't think we can afford four more years of Christy Clark and her rich donors calling the shots. I believe there's a better way. I believe we can have a British Columbia that works for everybody. I want to see an affordable British Columbia where services that you count on are there for you and an economy that works for everybody. The people at the top have had their premier. It's time you had one that works for you. Thank you very much, Mr. Horgan. Let's move on now to Andrew Weaver from the Greens. He has the next spot. Mr. Weaver, you have one minute. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for joining us here tonight for the debate tonight. You know, I'm thrilled to be given the opportunity to share with you our exciting vision of a prosperous future for our beautiful province. Like the rest of our exceptional team, I am not a career scient uh, a politician. I have come to this as a scientist. For most of my life, I've been an educator and a scientist. You know, just five years ago, I would never have imagined imagine myself as a leader of a political party. But after years of challenging my students to be more engaged in our democratic institutions if they wanted to facilitate change, I realized I needed to take my own advice. As so, when Jan Jane Stewart, the for Jane Sturk, the former leader of the BC Greens, asked me for the fourth time if I would run, I said yes. Since being elected, I've traveled across British Columbia, and wherever I've gone, British Columbians have said the same thing. They are desperate for a new vision for this province and th that they can vote for rather than being told what they should be voting against. Tonight, I'm excited to be given the opportunity to share the BC Green vision with you. 
Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Let's move now to Liberal Leader Christy Clark. You have 60 seconds, Ms. Clark. Thank you, and thank you for tuning in tonight. I know how busy everybody is, and I want to thank you for all that you do to help build a strong British Columbia. You know, doing what's right isn't always, what's do isn't always doing what's popular, but doing what's right is working. In British Columbia, we are number one in economic growth, number one in job creation. Our health outcomes are amongst the best in the world, and our students score amongst the best in the world when it comes to their test results. We are controlling spending, and that means that we can invest in health care, in hospitals, in schools, in roads and infrastructure without going into deficit. We are doing this together. But in the face of rising protectionism in the United States, the question in this election is which leader has the skills to lead us at, in a time of uncertainty? Which of us will protect and preserve jobs for British Columbians to secure a strong BC and a bright future? Thank you, Ms. Clark. And thank you all for staying to time. We do want to now focus on three major themes to begin this debate in earnest. And we asked for input from the people of BC and received an overwhelming response. In fact, we were inundated with emails. And there was one particular theme that emerged right off the top. That was the high cost of housing in this province. Let me give you an example. Peter Dent from Kamloops wrote that his two university educated kids say they just cannot afford to buy in the lower mainland and so they're looking to move somewhere else in Canada. This was a theme echoed over and over and over again and led us to choose housing affordability as our first topic. So the parties have drawn for spots and the first question for, from the consortium goes to John Horgan of the NDP. Mr. Horgan, your party's been preparing to become government for some 16 years now and as part of your plan to make housing more affordable, you've suggested a $400 rebate for renters. Now, we did the math, that works out to about $33 a month. Can you tell us how will that make a difference to housing? You have 90 seconds to respond. Uh, thank, thank you for the question. And the housing renter rebate is just one part of a multifaceted plan to make life more affordable for British Columbians. We've been raising alarm bells about the high cost of housing in British Columbia for the past three years. And what we got back from the BC Liberals was stone faces. No desire to take action to stop the flood of speculative money coming into the marketplace and driving up the cost of homes here in Metro Vancouver and in fact right across British Columbia. The consequence of that is that we have seen a $600,000 increase in the cost of a single family home between 2014 and 2016. If you can't find a place to buy, you should be able to find a place to rent, but we can't do that either. 15,000 British Columbians are on the wait list at BC Housing looking for affordable housing. We brought in the renter's rebate to match the homeowner grant, which has been in British Columbia for over 50 years now. If homeowners can get a break for owning a home, we feel that renters deserve a break as well. It's $400 that can go a long way to help people put a few more dollars in their pocket while they're trying to find a place to live. We also want to close the loopholes at the Residential Tenancy Act that allow bad landlords to make it extremely difficult for tenants by uh, making sure that they have to stick to leases, the rent eviction, demolition issues that are breaking out all over the Lower Mainland. Those are big challenges the leaders of the BC Liberal Party have failed to address. All right, Mr. Horgan, thank you for your response. Christy Clark is up next. Ms. Clark, our question to you, your government denied there was even a problem uh, with the housing market for a very long time before finally taking action. Why didn't you intervene sooner? You know, uh, the thing about home ownership is for people who already own a home, you have a lot of equity in that home. It is your investment and it's something that you want to protect. So it was really important that our government make sure we did all of our homework before we moved with a 15% tax on foreign buyers, which has had exactly the effect that we hoped it would. We moved on a luxury tax for uh, homes over $2 million. And now we are helping first time home buyers, 42,000, with a loan of up to $37,500 for each of them to help them scrape together that all important down payment. Now the NDP want to scrap that plan. And what they want to do is they want to support people staying in rental homes with a dollar a day. Even the NDP's candidates say that that is absolutely a drop in the bucket. I think most of us want our kids to be able to own their own home. They don't want the government, John Horgan is their landlord. 
they want to live somewhere that belongs to them. And so that's why we started the home program and that's why it is so important for people because first time home buyers should have a chance to get into this market. The foreign tax has had the impact that we wanted it to have. Relief on the property purchase tax is having an impact at helping people get into their first homes as well. We believe that the dream of home ownership should stay within the reach of the middle class and that's why we've made the changes that we have. Thank you, Ms. Clark. And last but not least, Mr. Weaver, uh, we know that the 15% foreign buyers tax initially did cool the real estate market to some extent. You are now proposing doubling that tax to 30% and expanding it across the province as well as increasing the purchaser's property tax. Are you concerned at all about the impact this may have on the equity that British Columbians have in their homes? Uh, no. In fact, we uh, recognize that what has happened is there's been a speculative housing market. Houses and accommodation should be there for people to live in, not to be viewed as commodities to trade like gold or potash. What we've recognized as well is this government has left this an, as an issue to get out of control. When the, when the uh, foreign ownership uh, tax was brought in, it was 15% only for Metro Vancouver. This has not solved the problem, and in fact, the government recognizes that they're expecting increasing revenue from the foreign tax. If the tax was to work, you would expect the incre decreasing revenue, but they're budgeting increasing revenue. We believe that this tax is to ensure that people in British Columbia can actually live in British Columbia, and so we're extending it to 30% across British Columbia, but not just for if you own a passport that's foreign, as the Premier did. What we believe is that if you live in British Columbia and pay, and you pay taxes in Canada, you have a right to live and, and own your own property. So that is, our, that is our approach. It actually puts pressure on the upside of the market. Our property transfer tax changes would actually make it cheaper for people to sell and buy homes under a million dollars. It only kicks in in larger amounts for those who have the meg mega mansions. Our purpose of this again is to put a clamp and pressure down on the upper end of the market so that all British Columbians can benefit. You know, I raised this legislature, this in the legislature first. And while the BCNDP would have said that they've been raising it for three years, the reality is for those three years, they haven't offered any solutions. The BC Greens are a solutions-based party and we propose a diverse array of, of policies that will make life affordable in BC. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Weaver, for your response. Now that you've heard the party's positions, we will get into the debate portion on housing uh, affordability. Leaders are going to have the opportunity to ask each other questions now about this first theme. And the respondents will have 45 seconds uninterrupted, and then the two leaders will debate that question for 90 seconds. The leader not involved in the debate will not participate. Again, we'll remind you, positions have been drawn, and Mr. Horgan won this particular segment. He will lead off with a question to Ms. Clark on housing affordability. Mr. Horgan, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Clark, you said you waited to get the right answer. Well, you waited. The average housing pr price in Vancouver went up $600,000, eliminating any prospect of young people buying a home in this province. Why did you wait so long? Was it because your rich developers were making a bundle, or was it you just didn't care about families not being able to buy homes in Metro Vancouver? Because we care about people who own their own homes already, too. We want to make sure that young people get into those first homes, but we want to make sure that if you own your own home, government wasn't going to take some initiative so dramatic and so harmful that it meant you lost the equity in the home that you've built. This has never, a 15% foreign tax on buyers has never been done in North America. We collected the data and we made sure we understood what was going to happen. And guess what? It worked, it cooled the market. But it's not all we need to do. We need to support first time home buyers getting into their homes with a, through the home program, which is up to a $37,000 loan. The NDP wanna scrap that. They wanna pay renters a dollar a day to stay in a rental accommodation. I think people wanna own the home that they live in. You now I met, to debate. Thank Go you. Ahead. I met today with young professionals, young families that can't afford to stay in British Columbia. They're leaving BC for other jurisdictions because housing prices are just too high. When I talk to CEOs of tech companies, they say the biggest challenge they have is re in retaining people is they can't afford to live here. They don't want to live in a basement apartment, but that's all they can find. Your negligence over the past two years has led to a market that is unattainable for the families you profess to represent. And, and to make renters second-class citizens, I think, is 
pretty, uh, I, I, well, I would call it patronizing, but, but I'll leave that well, up Mr. to you Horgan, to decide. How Why is, wouldn't how you be allowed to rent a How is $1 a day going to help a tech worker be able to rent a home in Vancouver? And how is scrapping the first-time homebuyers program, 40, uh, uh, 42,000 people, and no interest, no payment loan for five years for $37,500 for at the top end to so the that people can own their own home. How is scrapping that program going to make it more affordable in British Columbia? Unless why, you don't want should, people to own why their Why should home. anyone believe you now? Just before an election, you're always quick with a smile and a promise, but you don't deliver. It's the same thing when it comes to housing. The housing market has slowed, but the average price has not come down. I stood today with families in front of a home, 900 square foot home, $1.2 million assessment. That had gone up $300,000 over and the past 18 And you know what's going to make a home how a lot do, less affordable? Is, making, is not is having, is having job losses in British Columbia and having the highest unemployment rate in the country as we did I'll under the last there. NDP government. I'll Mr. stop Morgan. you both there for that portion of the debate. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to allow Ms. Clark, uh, to, who has a question for Mr. Weaver, and his answer will be uninterrupted, and then there will be time for a debate between the two of them. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Weaver, Dr. Weaver, you are adding three new punitive taxes for people who want to purchase a home at a time when government should be doing exactly the opposite thing, and that is lowering taxes for people who want to buy a home. How does that make life more affordable for people? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, in actual fact, for most people, the property transfer tax that we are changing would actually decrease the cost of buying and selling a home. What we believe is that in our society, taxes should be progressive rather than regresses. We believe those who have the ability to pay should pay a little bit more than those who don't have the ability to pay. One of the things we'll change, for example, is the homeowner grant. You know, somebody living in a mansion does not need the homeowner grant to the same extent as somebody who's earning, uh, sorry, somebody living in a mansion earning a lot of money doesn't need it to the extent that someone's struggling to get the, right out of the gates into their first home. They need it and a little bit more. So our approach is actually to incentivize through a progressive uh, taxation, the buying and selling of homes at the lower end and put clamps at the upper end, particularly to ensure that British Columbians can live in their own, own, own province. Well, what you're introducing, I mean, for viewers who may be tuning in for the first time to the election, are three new taxes, a lifetime capital gains uh, tax, an additional surtax on top of existing property taxes that would go to the provincial government, not to your local government, and a property transfer tax. And I always think that there's, it's, you know, politicians can always come up with new ways to get your taxes and spend well, more. But I think fact, we should Ms. make Clark. life more affordable by leaving that in people's pockets. In actual flat, Ms. Clark, Ms. Clark, what we are addressing is the issue that you have failed to address for the last number of years. We're addressing speculation. What we're addressing is people who flip homes. They live in a home for six months, they move to a new home, and they're using moving to homes as a, as a means of, of tra trading a commodity. Our lifetime capital gains tax does not apply to somebody living in place. It does not apply to someone living in a house for three or four years. It only applies to people who are flipping homes. The other foreign, the foreign buyer's tax is to ensure that British Columbians can actually live in our province. Well, but Dr. Weaver, I mean, let me ask you the same question that I asked of uh, Mr. Horgan, which is both of you are determined in your plans to kill jobs in British Actually, Columbia. What we're How does that do make it more Columbia? affordable, what, shutting down the 10,000 jobs at What we're proposing to do in British Columbia is to oppose. ensure that life is affordable for British Columbians, that British Columbians can actually live in their homes. We believe that it's time to put people first, not your corporate donors, not your union donors, but people first in the province of British Columbia. And that is the foundation and of the BC time. Green policies. And that is time. And Mr. Weaver, may I clarify for my own purposes. Yes. Is it Dr. Weaver you prefer or Mr.? I, I don't mind. You can call me Dr. or Mr. or you can just call me Andrew. <laughs> well, I'll or Dr. Mr. Or Dr. Mr. <laughs> or Mr. Doctor. I'll, I'll stick with the formalities, but which would you prefer, Dr. or I Mr.? Don't, I don't, honestly don't mind. All right. We had Mr. Weaver in the script, so I'll stick with that for now. All right. It is your turn to ask a question, and you've chosen to address Ms. Clark, so the clock has been reset. You have time for your question. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Clark, the housing crisis in BC has been getting worse for years, yet you've barely done anything to address it. Why are your limited measures only focused on Vancouver when people across this province are struggling with the costs of housing? Well, it's focused all over Metro Vancouver, so, um, you know, all the way from the, from the Langley uh, border to, to, uh, to the coast. Um, and it's a 15% tax on foreign buyers. First place it's been done anywhere in North America. 
Um, and it has worked exactly as we expected. Toronto is now copying what we're doing here and slowed down the rate of growth in the price of housing. We know we need to do more of that because we want to keep uh, ho homes and home ownership within the reach of the middle class. I don't think adding three new taxes, including a surtax on top of property taxes, is a way to make life more affordable. I don't think the NDP plan to scrap the home program makes life more affordable either. We need to keep it within the reach of the middle class, and the, all of the changes that we've made are aimed at that. Again, Ms. Clark, you've actually missed the point of actually dealing with the housing crisis. You have not addressed speculation. In the legislature, I raised the, the foreign tax years ago when talking about other jurisdictions. Finally, years later, you introduce it. In the legislature, I talked about speculative loop loopholes, the so-called bear trust loophole. It took you years to do it. And when I raised it in the legislature, your Minister of Finance said to, said to me, we're not going to do it because there might be unforeseen consequences. Sure, there were unforeseen consequences. A housing market that has got out of control. Ms. Clark, the housing crisis exists in Victoria, it exists in Kelowna, it exists in Kamloops, it's not just here in Metro Vancouver. Why have you left the rest of the province under the bus, thrown them under the bus? I you know, uh, Dr. Weaver, we have introduced the home program, which is a, a loan, an interest-free no-payment loan for first-time home buyers, up to $37,500. We've introduced the luxury tax on homes over $2 million. But uh, you know, D Dr. Weaver, your plan to add a surtax on top of property taxes is not going to make life more affordable people for people. Neither is Mr. Horgan's plan for a dollar a day to make sure people can continue to rent and never own the roof well, over well, their clearly, own head. I don't clearly, think either plan makes well, sense. Well, clearly your plan has not worked because we're in the crisis we're in precisely because your plan has not worked. Had the BC Liberals had a plan, listened to the BC Greens in the legislature, we wouldn't be in this situation today. But we, we didn't. This problem look, has got away from itself. You've so, taken too long to actually deal with it. And now you're doing stopgap message solely in Metro Vancouver. And thank you. We'll wrap up this portion of the debate. It is time to move on to the next theme. And whether it is jobs, investment and growth, or the debt, the economy is top of mind. And we saw this just yesterday as the softwood lumber dispute with the U.S. reared its head again. And that's a topic we may hear more about from the leaders uh, in this debate tonight. But for now, the first question on the economy by draw goes to Liberal leader Christy Clark. Ms. Clark, in the last election, you ran on a family's first agenda. In the last four years, however, BC hydro rates have gone up, medical services premiums have soared, ICBC rates have also climbed. Can you tell British Columbians how this is putting families first and helping them? Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Jennifer. Um, I, MSP rates for most people are now down back at 1993 levels. And um, we're making sure life is more affordable for people through that billion dollar tax cut through the MSP relief that we're offering on the way to uh, make sure that we eliminate it altogether as the economy grows. We are uh, making life more affordable for people who use the Portman Bridge regularly by about $1,100 um, by giving people relief on tolls and also um, a similar program uh, for $250 worth of relief for people who are using the ferries. But most importantly, in British Columbia, take home pay has increased by $8,500, most, uh, mostly because we have the lowest middle class taxes anywhere in Canada. And you contrast that with the last time the NDP was in power, an $8,500 a year growth, to a $400 loss in take home pay in the decade that John Horgan and the NDP were in power. The way to keep life more affordable, and you're gonna hear a lot of talk about taxes tonight, is not to double the carbon tax, which both John Horgan and Dr. Weaver are proposing. It's not to add surtaxes and more taxes for homeowners. It's not to roll MSP into taxes and call it, uh, call it by another name. It's to eliminate taxes, to make government smaller and put more money in your wallet, because I think you can spend it better than government can. Thank you, Ms. Clark. And our next question on the economy goes to the leader of the Greens. Mr. Weaver, uh, you've made a number of expensive promises, including free daycare for children under three, uh, expanding education to younger children as well. And on Monday, you released the cost of your platform. There's a $146 million deficit in the first year alone. Our question to you is how do you plan to pay for those promises and can British Columbia afford a Green Party government? Well, thank you for the question. Yes, in our fully costed plan, we have articulated a vision over the next four years, a vision to stimulate the new economy, a vision to move us to the 21st century. Our plan is budgeted, 
to be balanced over the course of the four-year four term that we're seeking. You know, there's nothing, nothing special about March the 31st in any given year. When government spending runs amok as, as ministries try to get the money out the door so they can start afresh on April the 1st. We believe that that's irresponsible governance. And what we should be doing is thinking about budgeting on the term of your, of your, of your office. Our plan is to actually ask people who can pay a little bit more to do so, provided we're telling them where the money would go. Our, our plan is also to ask corporations to pay a little bit more, and we're telling them where the money is going to go. You know, we're making public education our single most important priority. I stood on the legislature two and a half years ago and said we would make public education our top priority. And we've delivered over $4 billion invested in public education. But it's a question of priorities. The Premier's priorities, supported by the leader of the opposition, are LNG. That's why their plan is to subsidize wood fiber LNG, for example, and the 100 union jobs there to the tune of $440,000 a year per job. That is reckless economics. Our priorities are people and children. We believe that the citizenship in British Columbia share our priorities, that we need to put people first rather than the vested interests of our corporate donors on the left and the big union donors on my right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Our last question about the economy from the consortium uh, goes to the NDP leader. And Mr. Horgan, uh, you've committed to raising taxes for those making more than $150,000 a year, as well as increasing corporate taxes. Are those the only tax increases you will implement, or will there be more? In other words, are you promising to not raise any other taxes for four years if you are elected? We tabled a fully costed three-year fiscal plan based on the numbers that were provided by the Ministry of Finance in the legislature in February. We plan to roll back the, billion, the millionaire tax break that Christy Clark and the BC Liberals gave the wealthiest people in British Columbia, a billion dollars over the term in government, and give some relief to those people who are paying about $1,000 more a year as a result of the choices that BC Liberals made. ICBC rates, hydro rates, ferry fares, tuition fees. Wherever you look, wherever government could put their hand in their po your pocket, the BC Liberals have done that. We believe that a, that a modest increase in our corporate income tax by 1%, which would match Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, is reasonable. And I believe that our plan will work to put money back in people's pockets and keep the economy going. The BC Liberals, on the other hand, want to keep giving to the people that give to them. Their big donors get breaks while the rest of us pay the price. I think that's wrong, and I think British Columbians think that's wrong as well. For me, this election is about giving people an opportunity to live in their own province. We want to make life more affordable. We want to make sure the services that people count on are there for them when they need it, and an economy that works for everybody. That's not the BC Liberal way. They take all of their energy and put it into their big donors, and they leave the rest of us blowing in the wind. I think the time for that is over. I think on, in, in the days ahead, as this election runs down, the BC Liberals will have had their day, and it'll be time for the BC NDP to take power and build a better BC. Thank you, Mr. Horgan. Uh, that brings us to the leader-to-leader -leader debate on the economy now. And you've heard each leader raise planks in each of their economic platforms. Now might be a chance for them to hammer some of them down. The first leader up is Christy Clark. She's opted to use her first question to ask John Horgan of the NDP. Go ahead, Ms. Clark. Thank you. Well, Mr. Horgan has finally developed an interest in the softwood lumber agreement now that we are on the eve of an election. Since becoming leader of the NDP three years ago, he didn't raise softwood lumber even once in three years in question period. Why is that, Mr. Horgan? Well, Ms. Clark, if you came to question period more often, maybe I would have had the opportunity to do that. But it's a bit rich for someone who has been absent from the softwood lumber debate for two and a half years to now, 13 days before an election, to somehow say she cares about forest workers. There are 30,000 fewer forest workers working in British Columbia today than there were when the BC Liberals came to power. 150 mills have closed on the BC Liberal watch, and now Christy Clark expects you to believe her that she cares about the jobs that are at risk while she was chasing LNG and not focusing on our foundational forest industry. The, ch the consequences could be dire for forest communities and certainly dire for forest workers. My commitment is to work every single day so we can get a deal done in the interest of our forest sector and the interest of the people who work in it. 
Well, Mr. Horgan, I mean, I think we all understand why you haven't um, demonstrated much interest in softwood lumber so far. Three of your campaign officials are being paid from Pittsburgh, from the Steelworkers Union. You have taken the biggest political donation in BC history from the guys down in Pittsburgh, the same people that stood beside Donald Trump when he called our BC forest workers a disgrace. I think we are finally beginning that, to understand that why you just, never even raised it in the legislature. We never asked about we've it. We've raised forestry period. issues for the past four years. You, you have been Mr. sending Morgan. raw logs out of British Columbia at a rate that's unprecedented You've in British never Columbia history. You've never talked about the softwood deal in the legislature. 600 percent increase Morgan. in raw log exports. Those are jobs leaving British Columbia. You did not go to Washington to talk to the Trump administration. Rachel Notley did. You did not go to Washington to defend our interests. Brad Wall went to defend the interests of Saskatchewan. You've been absent on the file, Ms. Clark. The deal expired two years ago. Two years ago. And now, two weeks Mr. before an Morgan, election, you want I, workers Morgan, in BC respect, to believe you that you care about this question. I did ask you, you a don't. question. You don't. I, I did ask you a question, which is why have you never raised it in the legislature? You're never in the if legislature, Ms. Oh, Clark. You can, only, you can only ask a question if I'm there. Mr. We, Horgan, we you can asked, ask a question I any day you're there. I invite viewers to go and look up Hansard. I, I know you'd rather know. watch the hockey game, but go and look I at the number people, of times we've raised forestry in the legislature. And how often have you raised it, Mr. Horgan? And that put the Horgan. lie to what Ms. Clark just said. Mr. Horgan, I've gone and looked. I bet you, you have. haven't raised it in question period even once. And Thank I think you. it's a little That's bit unconvincing. That's just not true. That's I'm just not care about there. softwood now Thank you for you haven't shown an interest in it portion of the debate. Thank you for that portion of the debate. Mr. Weaver is up next. He has a question for Ms. Clark on the economy. And uh, you will have some time to ask that question and then a response and then debate between the two of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Clark, prior to the last election, you promised 100,000 jobs, a $100 billion prosperity fund, a trillion dollar increase to the GDP, frankly, a unicorn in each and every one of our backyards from LNG, yet you failed to deliver. Why should British Columbians trust you to deliver on your promises this time? Well, I think most British Columbians will know that oil and gas hasn't been a great uh, growth in, in the market recently. Alberta's got its problems because of it. And our LNG plan has gone slower than we wanted because of market conditions. I think people understand that. But I don't think people want us to give up. I don't think people want us to wave the white flag. And Dr. Weaver, both you and Mr. Horgan have opposed Pacific Northwest and the major LNG projects every single step of the way. I am going to keep at it because I am determined to build that prosperity fund for our kids. And I am determined to create those jobs for working people all across the province. There is only one party that has a plan to cut taxes, create jobs and control government spending. And that, Dr. Weaver, is the party that I represent, the BC Liberals. Well, Madam Clark, Mrs. Clark, you, Ms. Clark, you have no credibility on this file. The fact of the matter is you either intentionally misled or di simply didn't understand simple supply-demand economics. You, or you didn't understand the new economy. As I stood in the legislature for years pointing out that this was not going to happen, I recognize that it's a bit rich for Mr. Horgan to criticize you on chasing LNG because they were right behind you, right behind you, cheerleading you his way. As, as I stood there pointing out that the economics doesn't work. People have built ho hotels in Terrace in anticipation People have renovated homes in Kitimat in anticipation. You've misled them. Are no, you going to no, apologize? No, Dr. To them? Weaver, we are not going to allow you and the NDP to put an end to LNG. As the market improves, these projects will go ahead for British Columbians. But both of these guys want to wave the right flag and put an end to those jobs and those hopes and dreams of all those people who'd like to have a regular paycheck to look after the people that I'm they love. I'm not sure what jobs you're talking about, Ms. Clark, mm -hmm. because there are no jobs. In fact, so desperate is your government to land a single LNG project, so desperate that you're building the sightseeing dam to deliver power into our market for a market that doesn't exist at 15 cents a to kilowatt hour. To deliver clean to energy to for our kids, Dr. Weaver. To those plants who would, might choose to come here to make LNG. No, Dr. Weaver, you we want to we make make deliver actually, clean energy for our so kids. And so you are subsidizing... And, and we want to make and sure you're that subsidizing those, LNG sure that those LNG at wood fiber to the tune of $440,000 per person we don't want per to year jobs. on the back of taxpayers. We want to That's your priority, stuff. our priority is people. Thank you for that debate. Mr. Horgan, you are up next, and Mr. Horgan has chosen to ask Mr. Weaver a question about the economy in this leader-to-leader -leader debate. Mr. Horgan, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Jennifer. And uh, Mr. Weaver, you and your supporters will be surprised to learn this, I'm sure, uh, supported two budgets uh, that the B.C. Liberals tabled in the legislature that cut services for kids in education, cut services for seniors, and cut services in health care. Why would your supporters want to support a party 
that thinks that it's okay to balance the budget on the backs of the vulnerable, the weak, and those who need help. Well, well thank you for the question, um, Mr. Horgan. Unlike your party, I actually uh, think about what I'm going to vote for, and I articulate reasons why I vote for it. In any decision, it's about give and take. And in, in my case, I've documented why. What is a bit rich, actually, for you to have the audacity to criticize my voting record when I sat in the legislature for four years, and for four years, each and every one of your NDP MLAs voted collectively and together on every issue, even if it was fundamentally against what they believe in. To see some of your NDP MLAs standing up and voting for increasing thermal coal expansions out of Vancouver against what they believe her. To see Nick Simons not show in the room because he couldn't bear to stand up and vote. To see them vote for the LNG Income Tax Act. It is, you know, a bit rich for you to have the audacity to criticize the, the, my voting record, which is transparent and based on evidence. Mr. Weaver, what British Columbians have been tired of over the past 16 years is a B.C. Liberal government that doesn't put them first. And when your supporters see that you've supported that initiative, those, those budgets that cut classrooms, that cut uh, uh, resources to emergency rooms, and cut services for people, they have to ask themselves, are the Greens really in this to win this, or are they in this to keep Mr. the B.C. Horgan, Liberals in power? Because I, I know promise, everyone I talk Mr. to Horgan, wants the B.C. Liberals gone, unless I'm Mr. talking Horgan, to Greens. Mr. Horgan, I promise to do politics diff differently. I recognize as a career politician, you know nothing but saying no and being antagonistic to the B.C. Liberals. We need better governance in B.C. I'm antagonistic, to, I'm antagonistic with, with, with to a government that doesn't put people at the center of their policies. And the B.C. Liberals have been in this for their wealthy donors, and not clearly, for the people of clearly, BC. Mr. Horgan, not for the people clear, of BC. Clearly, Mr. Horgan, that's not the case. Because your decisions are putting your big labor interests first. Not at all. First not and foremost. We Mr. Horgan, focus clearly that's every day on no. making life better for British Columbians. We have made three commitments in this election campaign to make life more affordable for Uncosted citizens. Uncosted commitments that are irresponsible. Fully costed. And will fully cost, costed. But you have two economists coming out criticizing it. We had an two independent They hired two economists. Say that the Liberals our, hired our two economists, making them and not independent. Whereas your plan is is just simply la la land plan. Oh, you think goodness. money grows on my trees. Goodness. Are you going to lose your temper on me now, Mr. Oh, Horgan? Because you did on. it last week. Oh. So, you know, this is the problem with the BC NDP. They're very, and you'll hear it tonight. I, you all don't, Mr. You don't Horgan look like can a different politician to me, Andrew. You look like all the rest of the politicians. Criticize and criticize people, without ever people offering in the center a solution. Of our politics. Without ever offering a solution. Thank you. Now, that uh, brings us to questions from the consortium regarding leadership. How much of a factor is personality over policy when it comes to being premier? And we will begin with Mr. Weaver. Uh, Mr. Weaver, earlier this week you said the Greens stand for ordinary people in comparison to the Liberals' ties to big business and the NDP to big unions. We want to ask you if this is a close election, as many believe it will be. Uh, you may be in the position of deciding who will govern. So which party would you side with to form government? Well, thank you for the question. It's a very difficult question to answer right now because the people of British Columbia have yet to decide the outcome of this election. We respect the will of the people of British Columbia, so we have to wait until the election occurs. We have agreed and we have promised at all times to work with whoever forms government, and we would hope that if we form government, the, 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 my, my colleagues to my right and left would hope to work with us. I promised to do politics differently in the legislature. I worked to ensure that bills got passed. I raised issues in the legislature that were dealt with, and you can be effective in doing that if you actually treat your colleagues with respect. But when you're sitting in the legislature watching four years of Mr. Horgan hurling abuse at Ms. Clark and then ministers in Ms. Clark's government hurling abuse back, what you find is that it's difficult to work together. So BC Greens have put together an exceptional suite of candidates, an exceptional suite of candidates who are stepping aside from their careers, not because they want to be career politicians, but because out of a sense of civic duty, they believe we need to reclaim our democracy, reclaim our democracy for the people of British Columbia. And that's why I'm so excited about our team, and, and that's why you know, we'll wait to see what happens in the election. There's a process that has to be followed. You know, the process that is followed is the, is the party that wins the most seats must go to the Lieutenant Governor and seek uh, the decision to form or not form a government. We'll let the process up, uh, uh, form out and I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to Ms. Clark and Mr. Horgan phoning the BC Green office up and saying we'd like to work with you because we recognize you're the one controlling the majority or you're in a majority government or in a, a position. Thank you for your answer, sir. Uh, to the leader of the NDP now and Mr. Horgan, you have described yourself in the past as mercurial, which is uh, by definition synonymous with temperamental, unpredictable, volatile. 
Uh, the question for you is, and Mr. Weaver raised it about your temper, do you have an anger management issue? Oh, no, of course not. Uh, look, I'm a, an Irish descendant. I'm passionate. I got involved in public life because I wanted to make life better for people. And when I see a government that ignores children in care to the point where they take their own lives, I get angry, and I think British Columbians get angry as well. When I see a premier fight with teachers and make it more difficult to, to learn in classrooms for kids, a generation of kids, I get angry, and I think British Columbians do as well. I'm passionate, and I feel strongly about a whole host of issues, but I have always made it absolutely clear in my constituency and to wherever I've traveled talking to people that they are at the center of my politics and everything that I do. I get up every day trying to make life better for my neighbors, trying to make better, life better for my community, and try and make life better for British Columbians. That's why I'm in this election. That's why I think it's so important that after 16 years of neglect of the important things we need in our communities, it's time to send the B.C. Liberals to the opposition benches. And we put forward a platform that focuses on people, making life more affordable, not increasing hydro rates, not increasing MSP rates, not increasing ICBC rates, but putting a cap on those until we get to the bottom of the absolute mess that they've created over the past 16 years. These crown corporations are not instant teller machines for the B.C. Liberals. They were created in the past by the, by the SOCRED government and by the NDP government to be there for people not for politicians. We need to change that. And yes, I'm passionate about that. Thank you, Mr. Horgan. Our next question is to Ms. Clark on this topic. And in the past year as Premier, you've faced some controversy. Uh, the RCMP launched an investigation into campaign contributions as a result of donations to your party. You finally stopped taking a salary top-up after pretty big public backlash. And you also falsely accused the opposition of hacking into your party's website. How do you repair British Columbians' damaged trust in you? Um, well, you know, I think the thing that matters most to British Columbians is jobs. And in British Columbia, we've created 226,000 new jobs since the introduction of the Jobs Plan. We are number one in job creation in the country. We have the lowest unemployment in the country. It's sure a lot different from the NDP times when unemployment was double on Vancouver Island. It was 16% in places like Prince George. I think what matters to people is lower taxes. We are delivering a billion dollars in tax cuts for people. More jobs. We are number one in job creation in the country. And I would say that in these times of rising protectionism in the United States and the election of President Donald Trump, what British Columbia is going to need is a leader who is tough, but who is calm and is considered. A leader who does her homework we cannot win deals like the softwood lumber agreement, and we can't win the other protectionist measures that Americans are proposing to undertake if we don't control our tempers. I am someone, you're right, Jen, who has, um, in my first term as Premier, experienced some controversy. But I've always done that with the best interests of people at heart, making sure that we are creating jobs for people. I know that if we leave more money in your pocket, you can spend it better than government can. And I don't think government should get any bigger. That's what leadership means to me. It means remembering what's important to ordinary British Columbians, and I've always tried to stick with that. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Now the leaders get to ask each other about leadership. And once again, there is a question followed by an uninterrupted answer and then a 90-second debate. So we begin with Mr. Weaver of the Greens, who has a question for Mr. Horgan. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Horgan, you've played both sides of the big money issue, attacking Ms. Clark on the one hand for taking money from corporations and unions, and at the same time accepting them yourself. If, as you say, Mr. Horgan, we can't trust Ms. Clark because of these donations, how can people trust you? Well, thank you for the question, and uh, it gives me the opportunity to tell the viewers at home that we, over the past 10 years in the official opposition, have put forward legislation six times to get big money out of politics, to ban union and corporate donations, to put a cap on individual do donations, to put a cap on donations from outside of British Columbia, to do away with that. The B.C. Liberals voted against it. The B.C. Liberals wouldn't even allow debate to take place the last time we brought it forward. I believe that we need to get big money out of politics. And the first order of business for an NDP government is to do just that. It's not right for a government, ministers of the Crown and the Premier, to sit down with developers, mining companies and other companies, change permits, issue, issue regulation changes to help them without people in British Columbia being pretty skeptical. The way we get rid of that skepticism is to get money out of politics. 
Well, Mr. Hogan, you didn't answer the question. You specifically stated we can't trust the B BC Liberal decisions because of the money that's going to them. And you haven't answered why we can trust you. We know that the United Steelworkers are paying uh, two of your senior campaign directors to actually run your campaign. We know that United Steelworkers contributed $1.7 million to your campaign last year. You know, who's calling the shots on your campaign? Is it you or is it the United Steelworkers? How can we trust you when they we recognize that people don't donate $1.7 million to your your party without an expectation somewhere working that there's going people, to be some, some working people in a in a province where they've seen 30,000 jobs shed in the forest industry want someone that's going to champion for them the commitment I make to anyone who gives a donation to me is the same commitment I gave to the people at home I'm in this for you the day after the election if the NDP is fortunate enough to form the government we're going to ban big money we're going to say no more of that so do as I say not as I do to put people back do as I say not as I do back in the center do as I say not as I do people the BC Greens are principled. Uh, We're principled six months ago, you became principled. In September, six months ago, we banned in September. union and corporate donations to our party, recognizing that it was wrong and that it was a bit rich for you and your party to stand up and criticize the, the BC Liberals for funded, doing exactly what you were doing. The most corporate funded party in British Columbia day history day play, play is going to win the next election, Andrew, because they're taking big piles of money. The only way we stop that Did you is just to say put the BC Liberals the, are going to win the, the next election. The, the only way we stop that, that is to take the big money out of politics, and that's what we intend to do. So I can't believe you just said that, John. We will leave that debate portion on the floor for the time being. Mr. Horgan, you are up next if you would like to continue that topic. And you have chosen to ask Mr. Weaver a question thank regarding you. Uh, leadership. Thank you, Jennifer. Now, your deputy leader has said publicly he has no problem in uh, seeing four more years of Christy Clark. Uh, I think that your supporters who want to see the end of this government, the most corporate-funded government in the history of British Columbia, would be surprised by that. Why is it that it's okay for your deputy leader to say, I'm okay with the Liberals, while well, you say you want to change the government? Well, in actual fact, Mr. Horgan, uh, in actual fact, you know as well as I do that Mr. Olson was asked a question with respect to running in a campaign. Because, frankly, your supporters have, have rather than offering a vision, rather than offering a vision for British Clemens to get behind, you had 16 years to do that, Mr. Horgan. Mr. Horgan, 16 years. Your whole narrative, your whole narrative is to be better than the BC Liberals. Well, Mr. Horgan, better than really bad is still just plain bad. And this is yet another example. You don't offer people ideas. You don't offer people visions. You pull up rhetoric. You throw it out of context. And to, to you, you convince, sure, your partisan supporters think this is great. But that is not what you govern. You govern through principle and policy. You have to tell us what, what you do. You fail to do so again. You fail to do so for 16 years, which is why, Mr. Horgan, the BC Greens are growing across the province, because people know we're there for them. Mr. Weaver, you know full well that the people of British Columbia have had 16 years of a BC Liberal government that has put their corporate donors first. They've put the, put the people at the back burner and the BC Greens have been supporting that. You've been supporting that over the past four years. I think the people at home want to know, are we going to be electing a government that will put them first? Our platform is there at bcndp.ca for everyone to go and see. It talks about making life more affordable. It talks about the services that you care about. Health care, education, building transit, doing the things that will make our community stronger. Well, thank That's you, what Mr. we're Horgan. committed to. And that's what we plan Thank to Thank you for forward. reading your platform out to the crowd. The, the issue here, Mr. Horgan, is you have Andrew, had we're, we're 16 offering the public years. a change from Mr. what we've Horgan, had. You've had and some hope for years. the future. The BC I've Green Party years, will not Mr. take Weaver. responsibility the the for the fact for that you years. have been unable to inspire British Columbians. We for are inspiring years. British Columbians we will not in every take that corner of this province. You I was at the Commodore on the weekend playing the Commodore, Mr. Weaver, and there were a thousand people there. There weren't a thousand people in the Commodore because the reports were several hundred. You should have been at the Victoria Conference Center when we were. When we yeah, were yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Mr. Look, Horgan, Mr. Weaver, I'm, I'm tired. People want to change the government. I'm tired people want to change the government. And we're of offering this, a principal plan, a comprehensive plan to that make is life not better for British properly. Government. That is outrageous. And in fact, it's when not you look outrageous. at your education it's, plan, it's, it's the BC let's take a look at your it's education the BC plan. Budget. There it's is the BC nothing in there for education. You we commit four billion dollars to education. You have the audacity, the audacity to say that you're there for people. And there we go again. Personal attacks from Mr. Horgan. Really, he's there for the people. You need teachers to make that happen, man. I'll call for a timeout right sure. now and let uh, cooler heads prevail for just a couple of seconds. Ms. Clark, it is your turn to direct a leadership question to one of the other leaders, and you've chosen to direct it to Mr. Weaver. Thank you. And I will not debate whether my, ba uh, my rally is bigger than your <laughs> rally, uh, Dr. Weaver. <laughs> I don't um, want to debate that either. The, uh, the NDP and the Greens are in almost complete agreement to double the carbon tax in just two years, devastating thousands of jobs all across the province. Why are you putting those thousands of jobs at risk, Dr. Weaver? 
Well, thank you uh, for the question, and I, I'm, I'm very pleased that you put that. First off, the BC NDP have, have actually said they'll do $50 somewhere down the road. As you know, Ms. Ms. Clark, we believe that leaders lead. We believe that when Mr. Gordon Campbell stood up and recognized that climate change was an issue, he recognized that in every challenge is an opportunity, which is why the BC Liberals under Campbell took the position of raising carbon taxes to $30 a tonne. Did it, did it actually hurt the economy? No, the BC economy outperformed the Canadian co economy because it was emer the emerging economy that we took off in. We believe that this is the correct way. You're trying to take us back into the 20th century, chasing jobs that don't exist, squeezing water from rocks. The BC Greens have a vision for a new economy that puts people first, that recognizes our strengths and builds on those, not chase the weaknesses of others. Well, Dr. Weaver, British Columbia has led the way and we continue to lead the way in North America. No one else on this continent pays a $30 carbon tax right across, almost right across the board. We are proud of what we're doing. United Nations has recognized BC for our climate leadership. Recognize Mr. Which Campbell. remains, no, which remains. Recognize the World Mr. Bank Campbell. has done the same thing. You have no credibility and, on climate. And the reason the carbon tax has worked you have no is credibility because we on this put file. that money back into your pocket. Every penny the LA Times, that's been collected from the carbon the tax has, hold on a second, hold on a second, has gone right back into you're, tax you're cuts. Putting sound it's bites meant in rhetoric. We, you're not dealing meant, with the issue. It, it means that we haven't hurt jobs in British Columbia. It means that we've still been able to achieve being the fastest growing economy right, in the country. because you had a carbon tax. Because that, the carbon tax this being revenue arguments. neutral, going back into cutting people's taxes, so here's, here, you know, this the is economy strong. Arguments. You reality are planning is, to double it. Reality he is, is planning to double Times, it. The LA Times wrote a scathing assessment of your climate leadership and pointed out that BC has gone from climate leaders to climate laggers. British Columbians love to be leaders. They won't want to be followers. Leaders lead. They don't wait for others to catch up and then follow them. BC used to be a leader. I was part of that leadership team that set in place those policies. You set up a leadership team. You ignored the results. Mr. Horgan is taking some of their results and ignoring others. The United we Nations, the, Mr. The, Dr. Uh, Horgan, which, not uh, the LA Times has recognized the United us Nations as a climate recognized leader. Mr. Campbell's efforts, and frankly, and it's a bit rich no, for you to Mr. tell me what the Dr. United Weaver. Nations organized, as I've served on the UN <laughs> panel on climate change, not one, not two, not three, but four times over the years. Thank and you. that is time. Uh, we thank you for your uh, debate portion. We will continue uh, with debate between the leaders, but we want to switch just now to a little more free-form part of the debate that we're calling hot topics. Uh, the consortium came up with a specific question for each leader. They'll once again have a minute 30 to answer. Uh, there will be no debate again on these particular questions, but we're looking for uh, concise and direct answers. We'll begin with Mr. Horgan. You're on the record as being opposed to Kinder Morgan expansion against the Site C Dam project, as well as against the current proposal to replace the Massey Tunnel with a bridge. What do you say to people who are counting on those specific jobs? Certainly, the Kinder Morgan expansion is not in the interest of British Columbia. A seven-fold increase in tanker traffic coming out of our major metropolitan centre through the Gulf Islands and up the Strait of Juan de Fuca is not in the public interest, it's not in the interest of our economy, nor in the interest of our environment. With respect to Site C, I believe that every project that BC Hydro has done since the 1980s has had to go to our independent BC Utilities Commission to get independent assessment and approval and cross-examination of why BC Hydro Hydro's proceeding. Christy Clark said no to that and is ramming through a 9, 10, 11 billion dollar dam without anyone saying it's a good idea but BC Liberals. I don't think that's acceptable, particularly in light of the fact that hydro rates have gone up 87 percent on the BC Liberal watch. We have a whole host of alternatives that we could be investing in that are cheaper and will uh, serve us far better in the long term. The BC Liberals don't want to go down that road. When it comes to the Massey Bridge, I want to follow the mayor's plan, the 10-year plan to build transit and transportation in the lower mainland. And every mayor in the region, save one, thinks that the Massey Tunnel replacement is not the right solution for that problem. We need to deal with congestion there, but we have much more pressing issues. The Patella Bridge has passed its life, life, or life cycle. In five years, it needs to be replaced, and the Liberals have ignored that. They have gone forward with a plan that no one else in the region supports but them. That's not leadership. That's driving home a pet project, a vanity project, and that's why I believe we have to look at other solutions to meet our transportation challenges. Thank you, Mr. Horgan. Uh, Mr. Weaver, you are up next, and your hot topic question is this. Uh, you've come out with a comprehensive policy platform, and you are running candidates in almost every riding. What do you think your chances are of forming government, and what do you say to people who may think a vote for the Green Party is actually, in essence, a wasted vote? Well, thank you for the question, and I, I do appreciate it. Look, you know, 
In the last election, the party that won the last election was not the BC Liberals. It was the non-voter. 45% of British Columbians, that's almost one in two British Columbians, didn't bother to vote because they were not inspired to vote. The BC Greens off peop offer people something to vote for, not vote against. I know that there's a lot of people who vote BC Liberal, not because they like what they stand for, but they're scared about what the BC NDP stand for. I know there's a bunch of people who vote BT NDP, not because they like what they stand for, because they're feared or they dislike what the BC Liberals stand for. I encourage people to check out our platform, bcgreens.ca, because our future is in your hands. If you come out and vote, anything is possible. You know, this question could have been posed to, Ms. to Mr. Silver in Yukon, who had one seat going into the last Yukon election and came out with a majority government. This question could have been posed to Ms. Notley, who had four seats in the Alberta election, uh, prior to the Alberta election, and came out with a majority government. This question could have been posed to Mr. Trudeau, who had 33, I believe, seats in, in the third place and came out with a strong majority of government. It is presumptuous to think that anyone owns a vote. Each and every British Columbian owns a vote, and our future is in your hands. If you vote for what you believe in, instead of the fear-monging tactics, particularly for my, my colleague, Mr. Horgan, who, rather than inspiring a voter with a vision that they can get behind, essentially runs the narrative that you got to vote for us because we're better than the BC Liberals. And as I say again, better than really bad is just still bad. We need the best, and BC Greens are there to lead us into the 21st century. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. To Ms. Clark now, uh, you are often touting the economic success of the province, uh, yet BC still has the highest child poverty rates in the country. Welfare rates haven't risen in 10 years. How can you brag about the economy when it appears so many are being left behind? Uh, thank you for that. Um, Jen, we have reduced child poverty by 50% in British Columbia, but, and, but we need to do much more. And in a province that's got the fastest rate of economic growth, um, 226,000 jobs since we introduced the jobs plan, over 90% of them full-time jobs. We need to make sure that we are supporting people and finding their way into work. That is the best way to make sure people can look after the ones that they love. Being on social assistance isn't a great long-term answer for anybody. And I know that most people on social assistance do want to find their way into the workforce. So we've done a number of things, in particular supporting single parents, most of them moms, but some of them dads, finding their way into the workforce. We pay your tuition, we pay your childcare, we'll pay for your books, we'll pay for your transportation, and we will support you finding that skills training that you need to get off social assistance and into a job. Because I have always believed that the best way to alleviate poverty, and the reason we've been able to reduce it by 50% uh, for children in British Columbia, is because we create jobs for people. And we want to make sure people have the training to take those jobs, and that once they get a job, that they have a chance to get a better job, and that their children's ha children have a chance to get a job. Both the NDP and the Greens have a big plan to kill jobs in British Columbia. I'd like the chance to keep leading in creating jobs and making sure we stay number one. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Uh, we'll move to the second part of Hot Topics, and that's a chance for the leaders themselves to ask another leader any question they choose, no holds barred. And once again, we will adhere to these rules. 15 seconds to ask the question, 45 uninterrupted uh, seconds to reply, and then the two leaders will debate the issue for an entire minute and a half. The first leader to leader Hot Topic question goes to Mr. Horgan, who has chosen to direct his question to Liberal leader Christy Clark. Mr. Horgan, you have the floor. Thank you. After 16 years of illegal cuts to public education, after the Supreme Court said that your choices as Minister of Education and your choices as Premier were against the law, you've never apologized to the kids that lost a generation of educational opportunity. You have never apologized to their parents. You've never apologized to teachers. Will you do that today? Will you apologize to the kids, the generation that you stole? Uh, thank you for the question. I'm glad to get a chance to talk about education because I think it is the single most important investment that government can make. It is truly investing in our future. And when I think about how many parents come to British Columbia making tremendous sacrifices in order to be able to create a better future for their kids, we owe it to them to make sure that we provide them with the best education possible. Now, the NDP plan doesn't include a penny, a new penny for education. They must think that we're doing something right. And our kids in BC are number one in reading in international comparisons around the world, number two in science, number six in math. And as a result of the agreement that we came to with the BCTF, we are adding just about 3,000 teachers to classrooms, which I think will make it even better. 
That was a court-ordered agreement, Ms. Clark, and you were dragged kicking and screaming to that position. You shortchanged an entire generation of kids from kindergarten through grade 12 that didn't have the supports in classrooms that they deserved. They didn't have specialist teachers. They didn't have teacher librarians. They didn't have counselors. And kids couldn't get assessments for years and years and years. That's stealing a generation. You're only one young, young once, Ms. Clark, and you stole a generation of kids because of your bullheadedness on public education. Well, for I you don't, to stand I don't here now and say one. you care about kids I don't know what's is wrong. almost unbelievable. Well, it's I mean, almost unbelievable. The, the thing is, is that, I mean, that, that puts the lie to that is the fact that our kids are number one in international comparison. Despite when your it comes government, Ms. Clark, despite and your, number, because of the professionalism of teachers science, in this great province. And number six in math. That's pretty good. Our kids the are Supreme doing well. Court they can took continue. 15 minutes, hold on a second. 15 can, minutes second. to tell you you were wrong. We can continue to do better on you that. You can't though. apologize for but anything. But you know what? The NDP you will never take responsibility. haven't promised a single penny for education in British Columbia, not a new penny. We are investing in education because we you believe, and I anything, believe, it is the most never important investment. Never accountable, never responsible. The most That's important the investment liberal way. that we can make for our kids. Parents we are fundraising for textbooks. That's your legacy. We are Parents forced to <laughs> fundraise for textbooks. We are making that investment. And that's why our forced, kids are doing so well in British Columbia. We need to keep doing better so we can stay ahead, and we're going to continue to make that investment in kids. Fundraising for textbooks. That's a legacy. That's the BC Liberal public education legacy. I need to stop you there. We are out of time for that portion of the debate. Our next leader asking a question of their choosing is Greens leader Andrew Weaver, who is directing his question to Mr. Horgan. Mr. Weaver, you may go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask this. Uh, Mr. Horgan, you made a promise to abolish MSP premiums, yet you and your candidates keep changing your position on how you will pay for it. How can British Columbians trust that your leadership, when you, promise, when you won't take a clear stand on a major promise you've made? I've been crystal clear on medical services premiums right from the start. We are the only province in the country that has them, and over the past 16 years, the BC Liberals have doubled them. Every year from 2008 until this year, a 4% increase every January. And the BC Liberals refused to acknowledge this was a problem until they were, again, dragged, kicking and screaming. Our plan is to eliminate half of the MSP premiums by January 2018 and put in place a blue ribbon panel to look at employers, employees and others involved in the collection of MSP and eliminate it by the end of our first term. That's our commitment and that's what we're going to do. Well, well, may I proceed? Uh, yes, oh, the debate thank is you. again. Um, well, th that may be fine and dandy, but you know, you basically are saying then that you have a plan to develop a plan to come up with a plan. Correct. Correct. Mr. So how Weaver, can we Mr. Weaver, you have a plan I, to develop a plan to come up with a plan. Yeah. You stood before British Columbians and have told them you're going to eliminate MSP. And, and that you're is what we're going to do in the, in the term you're of our finance office. You said, Mr. Horgan. You can said I, earlier. Mr. Horgan, can I actually get some words in? Your finance critic said you were going to introduce into a, 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 a progressive system. You Nobody said earlier, knows what you stand for. You Nobody said earlier that you should for. be able to balance over the cycle of your time in government, and that's exactly what we're committing to. Why, is, that, why is it okay for you to say that, but not okay for me to say that? It's okay for you to say that, Mr. Horgan, but you have said so so many things. Only belong to you. you. Have so, I've said so many things. It's in Mr. the Horgan. platform, Mr. Weaver. It's in the platform. I've just said it again. We're going to cut MSP premiums in half in January, and we're going to eliminate them at the end of the first term of an NDP government. Taking advice from experts. And then set up a experts. panel to come up with a plan to have a plan to have a plan. No, a typical yeah, NDP yeah, will study it. Mischief making, Mr. Weaver. I've it's said fact. It's in your it, you, you say that you want to have a four-year plan, and that's okay for you. If someone else says they want a four-year plan, that's not okay. We've articulated well, precisely that, how we will that eliminate based MSPs on your part? Isn't by that, following isn't the Ontario model. I was the first to raise this in the legislature, the introduced first, pistons, pe the first, Mr. petitions Weaver's of 50,000 people, but, and got both parties here. The BC Greens got both parties to MSP make this election will be eliminated issue. in this the first term of why, an NDP government. This tells you MSP why will be eliminated. In the BC first Green term of because the BC we government. can make politics happen here in BC. Oh my goodness! You're gonna get mad at me now too, don't oh, John? Come on, man. All Let's right, let's going. keep this respectful, shall we? Uh, we do have the last of our open debate questions now. Liberal leader Christy Clark has a question for Mr. Horgan. Go ahead, Ms. Clark. Independent economists have verified that Mr. Horgan's economic plan is completely unaffordable for the people of British Columbia, resulting in higher taxes and huge deficits. Why are you putting, Mr. Horgan, our kids into a crater of debt to the tune of $6 billion? Well, first of all, uh, Ms. Clark, 
independent economists aren't independent when the BC liberal, liberals hire them to do the analysis. And they did an analysis, interestingly enough, on the fiscal plan that the Ministry of Finance tabled in the legislature back in February. We took the numbers that you put before the public and then ran off to spend public money campaigning, uh, spending tax dollars on $20 million worth of ads on television. We took those numbers and we made different choices. We made choices for people. We made choices to make sure that the services that people depend on and they care about were there for them. That's our plan. Based on the numbers your finance minister tabled, you hire someone to do an analysis. They're not independent anymore, Ms. Clark. They're employees. You hired two people from Ontario to do a hatchet job on the plan that we embraced that was tabled by your finance minister. Well, Mr. Horgan, it's a $6 billion plan. You've got MSP, which you're going to call higher taxes just by another name. Ms. Clark, That's you've, doubled, be another you've doubled MSP premiums over the past 60 years. They're at 1993 no levels. No credibility. They're at 1993 no levels, Mr. They are Horgan. not. They are going to change in they January. Are. They're going to change in January. Yeah, to this 19, is a typical to BC Liberal promise. Hang Trust on. us. Vote for us Mr. and we'll do Mr. something for you Mr. after Horgan. the election. So, Everything you do, Ms. Clark, Mr. is predicated Dr. on Weaver winning an election, like not on governing for the people of British Columbia. We would all like to be able to talk because I think British Columbians want to know what we all stand People for. People know what you stand for, and Ms. Clark, and the, that's why they want you The gone. NDP plan includes um, $6 billion in new spending that is going to have to come from somewhere. And they haven't accounted about how they're going to pay for that. You know it's why? It's accounted in, it's the, in the fiscal plan that we tabled two weeks ago. It's because it will be in higher taxes and it will be in deficits that our kids are going to have to ultimately pay as that balance debt in burden year one, Balancing year one, balancing year two, balancing year three, the same plan that you and your finance that. minister put Nobody forward. It's the Mr. same Horgan, plan you, you put forward. Mr. Horgan, you introduced, your government introduced eight consecutive I, it wasn't my government. unbalanced budgets. It's 2017, Our Ms. government has it's introduced five and we are committing to People at home want to know what are you going to do for them tomorrow. That's what they're interested in. You know what, Mr. Horgan, that's not true. For them I think people want to know what we're going to do for their kids and tomorrow, make sure that their kids tomorrow. have a bright future. I think all the people who sacrifice to look after their kids don't just want to know about tomorrow. I think people want to know what the long-term future That's tomorrow, is going Ms. to be Clark. I don't for know their what kids. And that means on. making sure that we relieve them of debt as much as we can, that we keep taxes low and create jobs for them and help them get into the sure. job market. Time is up. No, no you are sorry. correct. You are correct. It was a spirited debate. You both looked invested. I thought I would give you a few extra oh, seconds. Thanks, no, no, not at all. Yeah, not at all. Thank yeah, you for following the time. Unbelievable. It is fascinating to listen to. Uh, I just stopped talking, Andrew, that's all. No, 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 that's fine. Let's move on to questions now from the viewers and listeners. As I mentioned earlier, we received some 1,300 submissions, and we wow. do want to thank all of you that's for awesome. taking the time. Uh, but we were only able to use a select few, obviously. So in this round, things will speed up a little bit. Each leader will respond to the question with a 45-second or less answer. So here we go. Our first question is about the softwood lumber tariff announced by the United States. Vern Ratcliffe of Courtney asked this. What do you intend to do to help the backbone of this province with a 20% tariff on softwood lumber? Christy Clark starts us off, followed by Andrew Weaver and then John Horgan. 60,000 people depend on it, on forest industry, 140 communities. John Horgan hasn't raised it once in question period in the legislature. I am going to fight for jobs. I am going to stand toe to toe, I'm going to be tough, I will be strong, and I will be calm and resilient in making sure that we get the best, fairest deal for British Columbia when it comes to softwood. And you know, we all know why, uh, why Mr. Horgan turtled when it came to softwood. It's because he's taking his orders from the union in Pittsburgh that is fighting for American jobs and standing behind, beside Donald Trump when he, when he calls our forest workers a disgrace. We need to continue to work and to fight for you. I have a record of fighting for jobs in our province. I'm going to continue to do that when it comes to softwood. Um, and I want people in those communities and our viewer tonight to know, we've got your back. Go ahead, Mr. Weaver. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we've known about this uh, looming issue for, for two years now. And one of the things that has not happened is this government has not gone to Ottawa to, to raise this important issue, to get negotiations happening early, collectively, province-wide, Canada-wide. You know, um, our, our recognition is that the resources in British Columbia are owned by the people. They're not owned by multinationals. This government's approach has, to give t has been to give timber lot licenses to multinationals. Five companies own virtually all of our lots here in British Columbia. And these are the companies that are buying, buying up sawmills in the States to ship logs, raw logs, to the States to be milled there. You know, we need to take a good hard look at our licensing project because we believe BC companies, we believe BC people should be for, put first, not the multinationals who are, uh, are uh, based elsewhere. 
Mr. Horgan, you Thank have you. the floor. Thank you, Jennifer. I've worked in the forest industry. I represent a former forestry community that no longer is a forestry community because logs are leaving the community and going offshore. That's the BC Liberal legacy. Ms. Clark had two and a half years to stand up for forest workers in British Columbia, and she chose not to. She could have gone to Washington like the Premier of Alberta and the Premier of, of Saskatchewan to defend our interests against the protectionist administration. She chose not to. My commitment to forest workers and to people who are depending on a deal to make sure that we can continue to thrive and prosper with our renewable resource is to make sure that I am working on this every single day. I'll make sure that I have your back. I'll make sure that I'm in your corner fighting for you and fighting for a deal for British Columbia's foundational industry. It's critically important to me and it's critically important to British Columbians. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our next question now, and it is regarding the fentanyl crisis. It's from Jacques Mauru in Vancouver, and his question is, my family temporarily moved to Chinatown from Point Grey. That put us at ground zero of the opioid crisis. Every time we hear a siren, we think someone else has died. What would you do to address the problem? Andrew Weaver will start off for us, followed by John Horgan and then Christy Clark. Mr. Weaver. Thank you for the question. It's a great question. This problem has three aspects to it. Number one is the issue of prevention. Number two is the issue of harm reduction. And number three is a pathway to recovery. The BC Greens recognize that prevention, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's why we have, a, have made a promise to invest $4 billion in our public education system. We have a generation of children who've gone through the system, who've had those services taken away from them. They haven't had the psychological services child psychologists have been cut they can't get assessed and problems developed if you don't have the services uh, attracted when children are young that's our first commitment the harm reduction is being is actually being dealt with well by the BC Liberals but we also need a pathway to recovery and that's why we're investing and creating a separate ministry of addictions and mental health to pull that out of the health care budget to ensure that that remains a priority for us thank you mr. Weaver mr. Horgan thank you I was at a town hall meeting last week in Victoria when a mother and father asked me what we were going to do as a legacy for their daughter who died as a result of the opioid crisis. 900 other families had the same question for government, and I believe this is a critically important issue. We are going to make sure that in the BC NDP government there's a champion who gets up every single day and makes sure that mental health and addictions issues are at the front of their agenda. That's critically important to success. This is a mental health and addictions crisis happening in British Columbia, and we need to take immediate action. Uh, safe injection sites, critically important. Enforcement to make sure that the fentanyl is not coming into the country and working with the federal government, taking the $10 million that was in the federal budget and deploying it. The BC Liberals haven't done that yet. It's sitting in an envelope somewhere waiting for action. We need to take action now. Thank you, Mr. Horgan. Uh, and now the question goes to Christy Clark. Well, uh, thanks to Jacques for the question because I know it is something that many, many, many people across our province are deeply concerned about. I'm a mother. I am deeply concerned about it too. Um, and I, I do think that there are some things that are really above politics. Not that we don't talk about them in debates, we should. But we shouldn't play politics with that. Because people are losing their lives. Over a thousand people so far, or about a thousand people so far, have lost their lives, lives to opioids. We are leading the continent in British Columbia, $100 million spent on supporting people, um, finding their way to recovery and saving lives. And I know that many people think, well, why are you helping people who put drugs in their body? Nobody should use drugs. But we should remember that every single one of those people that has died is loved by somebody, and they deserve our help. Thank you, Ms. Clark. We will change gears slightly. Our next question is one from Jacqueline Murray in Delta. And I do have to tell you, this is one of many who wanted to talk about tolling and traffic gridlock and driving in this province. Uh, Jacqueline wanted to know why just a few crossings have tolls. And she asks if it wouldn't make sense to have minimal tolls on all crossings. John Horgan starts off, followed by Ms. Clark and then Mr. Weaver. Thank you for the question, and, and I absolutely agree. What, and that's why we're eliminating the tolls on the Port Man and the Golden Ears Bridge so that we can stop the congestion that's moving to the Patello and the Alex Fraser. People can't afford to cross the river, therefore they're going to other jurisdictions. The BC Liberals built a four and a half billion dollar bridge and then they expected one group of citizens to pay for it. We're not paying tolls on the, the uh, Sea to Sky Highway. We're not paying tolls on the new bridge in uh, Kelowna. I believe that public infrastructure belongs to all British Columbians. We have to make sure that we have a coherent plan to build for the next generation and we have a capital plan that'll put 96,000 people to work building new transit, new infrastructure in the lower mainland and right across British Columbia. I think that's good for our economy. It's good for our, our, our environment as well. Ms. Clark. 
Thank you. Uh, but I should add, Mr. Horgan has opposed almost every other public infrastructure project that's gotten underway since he's been in the legislature, including the replacement for the George Massey Bridge, including the Portman Bridge, including the Sea to Sky Highway, including Site C, all things that would put a lot of people to work. But to the question, on the toll plan, our party is the only one with a fully costed, believable plan to make sure that we support people uh, making uh, frequent com commuters and making life a little bit more affordable. It's a, up to about an $1,100 savings by capping tolls at $500. The NDP plan is to loot the prosperity fund, our children's inheritance of $500 million, and then after that, tax everybody in British Columbia to pay for tolls um, down in the lower mainland. I don't think that's the right way to go. And Mr. Weaver, your response to the question from our viewer. Yes, thank you for the question. You know, this is part of the problem with politics in British Columbia. On the one hand, just before an election, you have the NDP trying to buy votes. On the other hand, you have the BC Liberals trying to do the same thing. You know, we recognize those tolls were put in place for a reason. Good public policy ensures that, that you, you actually use your, 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 the tools you have to actually pay for the infrastructure you're developing, to actually ensure that you, we want to encourage people to get out of the cars. That's why the BC Green approach is to invest heavily in, in public transportation. We will be meeting the mayor's 10-year mayor's, uh, uh, mayor's plan, because that is the real issue. People cannot get out of the cars if they don't have the opportunity to get out of, out of their cars. That is the BC Green approach. It's not to do cynical uh, vote buying or, or vote getting. It's to actually do what's in the best interest of public through good public policy. And we have another question from someone who wrote in to us. Patricia Beaton of North Vancouver would like to know, if your party in particular forms the next government, what will you do to support young people who are aging out of foster care? Christy Clark starts this one, followed by Mr. Weaver and then Mr. Horgan. Uh, thanks for the question, Patricia. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, become, it's a real issue in British Columbia for young people who have spent their time in government care trying to find their way after they leave government care. And, you know, the, real, the fact is, government doesn't make the best parent. We need to make sure we do everything we can, and we are, to make sure that fewer children find their way into government care by supporting families in doing a better job. That's how my mother spent most of her volunteer tier hours as I was growing up. But if we can't, and we recognize we can't do that for everyone, we need to support children who are in care, especially as they are aging out. So we've extended the amount of time over which we can continue to support children who are in care after they age out and make sure that we are supporting them along the way in finding, um, finding their path, which is sometimes a really difficult one. We need to stop you there in the interest of time, Ms. Clark. And to you, Mr. Weaver, your response. Well, thank you for the question. Um, Ms. Clark, your government has no credibility on putting families first or dealing with children in foster care. Frankly, it's shocking what's been transpiring over the, over the last few years. The BC Greens have a very clear plan. We recognize that children born into situations that they had no control with need a little helping hand to get through. So that's why we introduced the concept of something known as basic income, to ensure that all those children aging out of foster care, uh, out of, out of of aging out of foster care will have access to basic income which will ensure that they get off to a good start. It's a great investment in our youth of today to ensure that we're not dealing with problems tomorrow. That's why whole, our whole approach is to actually invest in prevention, give people a fighting chance so that we're not dealing with problems in a reactive way which both these other uh, parties will do. Mr. Horgan, you have an opportunity to respond to the question from Patricia. Thank you very much and thank you for the question Patricia. Alex Gervais and Carly Fraser took their own lives because they were fearful of what their life would look like when they aged out of care. I think that's the critical issue that we need to focus on here. Young people are not getting the supports they need when the state is responsible, when the state is the parent. We have a fundamental obligation, all of us, to make sure those children are getting the best care possible and bridged into their adulthood if required. The, the children's representative, Mary Ellen Trapelafon, has made dozens and dozens of recommendations to government about extending the time that, as other provinces do, extending the time kids in care can have supports so they can thrive and prosper and realize their full potential. The BC Liberals have ignored those. We're not going to do that. Thank you, Mr. Horgan. Our next question comes from Sharon Hales in Richmond, and she writes, the New York Times branded BC the Wild West of political donations. What will you do to address the perception that favors can be bought through donations? We'll go first to Mr. Weaver, followed by Mr. Horgan, and then Ms. Clark. Well, thank you for the question from our party. I think we're the only ones with clean hands on this. We recognized 
that you cannot talk about being principled. You cannot talk, take the high road and argue against union and corporate donations while you continue to do it yourselves. I've turned down I don't know how many corporate donations. And the reason why we've done this is because we believe it's wrong. The BCNDP will criticize the Liberals for doing this, and they'll still have the same $5,000 a plate per, per meal pay for access events. They'll still accept $1.7 million from the United Steelworkers. They'll still accept staff being paid by the United Steelworkers to run their campaign. Like, who is setting the stage? The key decisions in this campaign are being made by people from the United Steelworkers who've been dropped into the BC NDP. This is, this is wrong. And BC Greens recognize the principal approach is do something about it ourselves. Leaders lead. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. Mr. Horgan. Thank you very much. Six times we've tabled legislation in our legislature to ban big money in politics, stop union donations, stop corporate donations, put a cap on individual donations, and the BC Liberals said no. They said no because they like it this way. Ms. Clark said no because she's had a $300,000 salary top-up over the past six years as she's been the leader of the BC Liberal Party. That's unacceptable. If you're sitting down in the home of the former CEO of Weyerhaeuser, the same company that's brought a petition against forest workers in British Columbia, I think people should rightly be concerned about that. When the Minister of Mines sits down at a private dinner with mine corporations that are, that are violating laws, I think you need to change that. That's what we've said. That's what we're going to do. Thank you, Mr. Horgan. Ms. Clark, your response to Sharon Hales? Well, thank you, Sharon. I appreciate the question. And, you know, it's um, listening to John Horgan, you might um, not realize that he has taken the biggest political donation in B.C. history. Three of his campaign staff are being paid by a union out of Pittsburgh that is fighting with Donald Trump to kill forestry jobs in British Columbia. He's taken over $100,000 from the B.C. GEU, and now he suddenly wants to put marijuana in our liquor stores, despite the fact that no one in North America is doing that. The system needs to change. And so we will appoint an independent panel, not political, who will make recommendations that could be unanimously endorsed by the legislature to change the way fundraising is done in British Columbia. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Let's move to a question from Willie Olson from Langley, British Columbia. He has a question about medical wait lists, and he says, I spent $14,000 on knee operations. To wait for an MRI and surgery in the public system would have been three and a half years. I'm concerned about this, as well as waste in the system. What are you going to do about it? This question goes first to Mr. Horgan, then Ms. Clark and Mr. Weaver for 45 seconds each. BC Liberal ignoring challenges like wait times in our emergency rooms, wait times for surgeries is a critical problem in this election and going forward. We need to make sure we're providing services for people that they need. That's why we're proposing to put in place urgent care centers so that we can stop the, the, cloudy, uh, the clogging in emergency rooms and make sure people are getting to wards and getting the surgeries that they need. I believe that's the solution. Bring on more healthcare professionals to meet the needs of individual patients, nurse practitioners, therapists, dietitians, everyone in the continuum of care in one facility so that doctors can focus on the surgeries they need and we need to increase surgery times. That means more operating hours and that means more investments in public health care. The BC Liberals are prepared to let that ignore that. I'm not. Thank you, Mr. Horgan. Ms. Clark? Thank you. Um, well, Mr. Horgan doesn't tell you that when his guys were last in government, they didn't add a single new space for doctors to be trained. They cut 1,600 full-time nurses, and worst of all, they cut a third of the beds in BC hospitals. And the reason they did that is because they ran out of money. They were spending so much of your money that they ran out and they had to cut health care. That is the wrong way to look after our health care system. We have some of the best health outcomes in Canada. Under the NDP, there was a, the wait list went up by 110%. We are working to make sure we are investing in health care, and we're doing that because we have a strong economy, because we're creating jobs across the province that gives us the means to build hospitals, to train doctors, and to make sure we're looking after people. And we will leave it at that uh, on that particular question, but we have one more question that we heard more than once. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Weaver. Pardon me. Go ahead. Go well, ahead. That's Pardon okay. me. I, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. um, it's a complex question that 45 seconds is very difficult to deal with. I encourage, uh, encourage you to look at our platform because we believe that healthcare, throwing more money at the system in a top-down uh, uh, manner, is not actually dealing with the, with the issues in healthcare. Our approach to healthcare is more community-based, to actually build from the bottom up community health centres, one-stop shopping centres, which will pull, the, will pull a lot of the, the pressures that are in our acute facilities out of the hospitals to ensure that there's more room there. We also believe that we need to separate chronic 
and acute health care. So we're also going to take measures to ensure that the chronic care being done in the health care system is actually taken out of the hospitals and into the right place. And also we have measures to actually ensure that people can stay in home. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Mr. Weaver. We're going to ask the leaders to keep the next question to 30 seconds as we are getting into a bit of a time crunch. Uh, Ravindra Lachman from Kelowna wants to ask all the leaders, will you change family day so it aligns with the other provinces? <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, is it the question to Go me ahead. again? Yes. The, uh, thank you, Ravinda. I was really proud to introduce family day. I care a lot about families in British Columbia and I wanted to make sure there was a day for families to be together. And the reason we chose the day that we did is we did a public, ref well, we did a public uh, process. We asked people to vote online and the vast majority of people voted in favor of the day that we have. Um, and you know, one of the reasons that day is so great is it's different in other provinces. So you know what? When you go to the ski hill, when you go to Big White in Kelowna, you're not in a huge lineup with a bunch of folks from around the rest of the country. Mr. Weaver, you have 30 and seconds. Thank you for raising that because the real reason we have Family Day on a different day is because of ski industry lobbyists who went to your government and wanted it to be so. You know, there's a whole group of people out there who cannot appreciate the Family Day because the rest of Canada and the U.S. is working on our Family Day. So uh, uh, they are taking off the, the, on their Family Day, our people have to go to work and they does nothing to do. It's, it's outrageous. So not only do I agree with that, I introduced a private member's bill this past session to do precisely that. Bring family gay across to Canada to be the same. Mr. Horgan, 30 seconds. Absolutely. Uh, again, Ms. Clark had a, a bogus consultation and she got a couple of, uh, of uh, clicks on a website and said we're going to do it on that day. I agree with Mr. Weaver and I agree with the vast majority of people across the country. We should have family day on the same day so that we can all celebrate. We can all take some time off, some precious time, and spend it with our family. I, I know that I would rather be spending the time with my kids on family day and they're living in different parts of, the, parts of the world. Let's make sure that we're like everybody else. I think that's common sense and I don't know why the Liberals don't get that. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Horgan. And that is all the time we have for questions from the people of British Columbia. And so we will be concluding now with closing remarks from each leader. And each leader will have one and a half minutes. Liberal leader Christy Clark is first off. Ms. Clark. Uh, thank you very much and thank you for tuning in tonight, uh, especially for those of you who stuck with us to the end. I know you work hard for your family and you contribute so much to BC. And that is why I am so determined to make sure that we protect jobs and keep BC on track. You know where we stand. That's a bigger economy, not a bigger government. It's lower taxes, not spending sprees. It's making sure we're investing in hospitals and schools and infrastructure, not paying massive interest payments to banks in the United States and in London. Our plan helps you create and live the life that you want. It helps you get a great paying job. It helps you own your own home. And most of all, it helps you keep more of your hard earned money in your pocket. But with the election of President Trump in the United States, BC is facing a rising tide of protectionism. They've already gone after aluminum, forestry, and agriculture. What's next? Is it tech? Are they going to go after our financial sector? And the question in this election is who is best to lead that fight to protect, preserve, and create BC jobs? Neither the NDP or the Greens can fight for jobs. Both of these men have spent most of their political careers trying to fight against jobs in BC. John Horgan is compromised, and Dr. Weaver just isn't that interested. Only today's BC Liberals can lead that fight. And I'm asking for your vote so that I can have a strong mandate to continue to the fight to, to support BC jobs, build a strong future, and a bright future for our kids and grandkids. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you very much, Ms. Clark. Mr. Weaver of the BC Greens, you're Well, thank up. you. That was a remarkable revisionist closing remarks. You know, it's pretty clear from that closing remarks that it's time for change. Not only a change in government, but also a change in the voices that represent you, the people of British Columbia. The BC Liberals have failed to deliver on their promises, and they are out of touch, simply out of touch with the increasing uncertainty and growing anxiety that many of you are facing. Yet after 16 years, the best the BC NDP can offer is being a little bit better than the BC Liberals. They've repeatedly failed to inspire us with a creative vision for our future. You know, the BC Greens have a plan to position British Columbia as a leader in the new and emerging economy. Our plan puts people, not vested corporate or union interests, first and foremost in decision making. And it will bring prosperity to all British Columbians, not just the very wealthy.
The BC Greens recognize that leadership means finding the opportunity in every challenge. We recognize that leadership means no longer accepting union and corporate donations, while the BC NDP and the BC Liberals squabble who is, over who is the least bought off. You know, quite frankly, neither of them can be trusted with a majority government. And that is why I hope tonight you will have seen that you will agree with me that it's time for a change, a change that you can count on. Thank you. And now to Mr. Horgan for his closing remarks. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you to the viewers at home for sticking with us for the full 90 minutes. It's been a, a feisty debate, a feisty discussion, but I believe it's made very clear to you the choices you have to make over the next 13 days. Do you want four more years of increased costs, higher MSP premiums, higher hydro rates, 42% increases in your ICBC costs, a break on tolls, but not really a break on tolls. You'll have to elect the Liberals to see what they do. We've made commitments in this election campaign to make people the center of our politics. We've made the commitment to make life more affordable in British Columbia. We've made a commitment to make sure that the services that you count on are there for you when you need it. Public education, public health care, seniors care, and $10 a day child care, a program that will make sure that women can get back into the workforce. It's good for kids. It's good for women, it's good for families, and it's good for the economy. We have an exciting plan for a better BC. We've been working hard on that and we've laid it out, fully costed, a three-year plan that will meet the needs of your family and your community. I think it's time for change. I think it's time that the BC Liberal neglect ends. Help is on the way. On May 9th, I ask you, I urge you, I appeal to you, if you want change in British Columbia, if you want to get the wealthy and, connect, wealthy and the well-connected off the train, vote BC NDP. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Horgan. Well, that brings us to the end of this debate. Thanks, well Jim. done. Thank you so much. We have covered a number of topics that people of this province are obviously concerned about, everything from housing affordability to the economy to the state of leadership. We've heard from more than 1,000 British Columbians with questions ranging from the opioid crisis to the family day holiday. And on behalf of the broadcast consortium, I do want to thank all the people who took the time to email us. And I also want to thank the three leaders who are here tonight. Hopefully it has been enlightening for viewers and listeners all across the province. Please don't forget to get out and vote on May 9th. I'm Jennifer Burke. Thanks for spending the last 90 minutes with us. Have a good evening. it's time for some analysis get into the nitty-gritty of all of the topics all of the body language all of the back and forth between those three leaders the Greens Andrew Weaver John Horgan with the NDP and Christy Clark with the BC Liberals and to help us break it all down and get into that substance we've Elise Mills former Liberal strategist and Bill Thielman longtime NDP strategist Thanks for joining us today, and thank you for thank everybody you. joining us here on Facebook Live on CBC Vancouver. At least let's start with you. How did Christy Clark do tonight, performance-wise? Did think she get her message across? I think she did. I think she did extremely well. I think there was a lot of testosterone in the room. There was a lot of chirping between Andrew Weaver and John Horgan. And for one man that says he's not angry, he he was pretty angry. And I think Andrew Weaver can attest to that. Mm -hmm. I think it was a good idea. The premier understood when to get in the game and when to step away a little bit and not be dragged in the undertow of of that sort of anger and negativity and personal attacks. I think it's important for her to separate herself. I think it shows the leadership that she's earned. And uh, I think she made it very clear what the plan was going to be in her mind, what her vision was going to be for the next, not only for the next four years, but how that loops back into everything she's done to this point. Everything makes sense. Everything's costed out. There is an answer for everything, unlike the NDP and the Green Party. <laughs> Mr. Thielman, before we get to the reaction. Is the advertising over now? No, yeah, absolutely, thankfully. Facebook Live and all of that. Let's talk about John Horgan's performance. Sure. What did you make of how he, how he did? I was very happy with it. I thought he did an excellent job. I thought he answered some of the questions that some people may have had after the radio debate. I thought he prosecuted the case against Christy Clark very well. He also, uh, I actually, I think the angry person on that mm -hmm. TV program was Andrew Weaver. I was kind of surprised. He was very chippy. He was mm -hmm. very interruptive. He uh, made several comments. He was, he seemed agitated fairly regularly. And I don't think it really works on a TV medium. Um, the Premier, 
I thought was uh, a little lackluster for her. She's a good performer. She's a good campaigner. I'll admit that. I just thought she wasn't really at the top of her game today. I'm, I'm not sure what it was, but Do you she, think was, she, she did have back? a two on one. She did have a two on one attack by by both Weaver and Horgan, and that's more difficult for anybody who's in that mm -hmm. position. We heard the comment about uh, the question to uh, uh, John Horgan about Do you have an anger management <laughs> problem? He said he's passionate. He's Irish. We saw a number of Irish people decide to tweet out after that. At least what about included. indeed? What did you Very make of offended. this before? I mean, what, what about that? Well, I mean, first of all, can you imagine if that was a comment that was made about the Asian community, the Italian community? I'm Irish Italian, so if any, I can tell you right now, the Italian community, there would be huge backlash. He would lost votes in that. Um, is are the Irish the last acceptable group that you can make fun of or degrade? I mean, it's so insensitive. It's so intolerant of his own culture. But anyway, but the excuse factory around why he's an angry man. Uh, I think men making excuses for their anger. Uh, it's 2017. You, you keep it in check, you're a grown man, and behave as such. Let's get into the questions. We have a lot of them from our audience in our Facebook Live comments today. Comments and questions. From Carla Cristofani, who says, No young person would vote for Christy, ask all my friends. She sounds nervous. Bill? Yeah, it's kind of funny, as I was saying before, she did seem off her game a little. She looked down at her, her notes a number of times, I noticed. and um, Which is not, not it's nothing, nothing wrong. No, there's nothing wrong with it. But it just it seemed to me that she was not as, and this was in the radio debate as well, she didn't seem as well prepared as mm -hmm. you expect the Premier to be. And, and she obviously has a lot of different responsibilities and things to do on top of being an opposition person uh, where you you're actually can spend more time at it. Mm -hmm. But I just I didn't think she did a great job there. I thought she was hesitant and um, not not really answering some of the questions. I also, I just don't like the style of, uh, what do you do about this? Jobs, what do you do about that? Jobs, and then eventually maybe answer the question. Mm. At least to you, Neil Parkinson Dow says, quote, poor John Horgan, all he knows is key messaging. He did stay on message. There were, there were a lot of spirited attacks, particularly between initially him and uh, Andrew Weaver, but then to Christy Clark. How about that interaction? Well, just getting off of, jumping off of mm -hmm. where Bill's coming from on this, I mean, Bill's right. John Horrigan should know his plan better. He should be able to defend it. If it is, if he really does believe it's costed and that the economists are wrong about this and that there are no gaping holes, why is he sort of sidestepping and, and reverting back to those talking points? I mean, versus Christy Clark, who managed and to Carla, I think it was Carla's point. Carla, she did softwood lumber yesterday. I mean, this is a major trade dispute. This woman has a le job in leadership protecting our province. Mm -hmm. She might be a bit tired. I'm gonna, I'm, and I think Bill even gave her that. But with John Horgan, he's he needs to, and I, I mean this in all fairness, he needs to be able to uh, defend and push back against those criticisms if they're untrue. And he's unable to prove that they're not true mm -hmm. because we know they're not. <laughs> we knew this was going to get political, I, obviously. No. If you're just joining I just us do now, this now to bug Bill. That's, I don't know what you said. And occasionally it works, that's right. Welcome to Facebook Live on CBC Vancouver. We're joined by Elise Mills, Liberal Strategist, and Bill Thielman, NDP Strategist. We're taking your comments and questions on BC Debate 2017, the only televised leaders debate. Let's go to another question now. We have Elise Velasquez who says, John Horgan won hands down. He's passionate, smart, relentless in his care for the working people of this province. Christy Clark seemed lackluster and Andrew Weaver was so agitated and angry. That was that's, what I thought too. That's a bit <laughs> direct. I mean, is yeah. it, is it uh, with all the spirited discussions, did the messaging still get out about the various platforms that these people well, have? I, I think the challenge you have, the format, I had some problems with. I just mm. find that when people talk over each other, no matter who does right. it, it just isn't great television. And so that's one of the challenges. And uh, John Horgan made a telling point, I thought, that had nothing to do with the policy. He said, he said uh, I know a lot of you would uh, would be rather watching the hockey game, but look it up on Hansard. And it was just like, yeah, I'll bet you a lot of people mm. were sitting there thinking, yeah, this is... And mm. I think, if at least, if I can say something we said in the, in the room, I think we both agreed it wasn't the most dynamic debate we've no. seen. Mm. Right, and I know we what actually, Bill and I do agree yeah. a little bit more than maybe we play on television. Hold the phone, folks. We have <laughs> key will, messaging going on here. But if I can yeah. answer that question, yeah. and I and is in her name Elise as well. Apparently. 
Indeed. Okay, dear Elise, I don't know mm -hmm. how you can suggest that anyone's standing up for the for the workers of British Columbia when your income's grown, as the Premier said. This was for, by far, for me, one of the best uh, talking points because it significantly illustrates the mm -hmm. growth and change uh, management in British Columbia. So your income has grown by $8,500 uh, $8, uh, in the last uh, five years. Under the NDP, there was a negative of $400. British Columbians lost an average of $400 off their income. Those are questions that John Horgan can understand. No offense to Bill, but that is still, and even after the debate, still is John Horgan's weakest. But I agree with Bill. I think the debate itself was somewhat lackluster. I, I'm going to account this to the fact that they've, the three of them have had to deal with, I think, a quite a heavy policy issue that's mm -hmm. come into this. This is very different from 2013. The, um, the global winds of change have affected us more. We've seen, uh, we've seen issues around pipelines as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just a lot of a heavier there's more density to the topics, I think. Fair enough. Now, we, we, I, and noting that the rise in income that, that Chris, Christy Clark pointed out, but also John Horgan and Andrew Weaver retorted MSP increases, BC Hydro increases. I mean, is that, is it, does that still carry weight there, Bill, when you hear about, oh, well, your income's gone up $8,000, but uh, you're still paying more in fees? Well, people don't feel that. People don't feel that they've got ahead. And, and Elise can state all the facts and figures she wants, but when people don't feel that they've achieved a benefit, and I think it, particularly in, in forestry communities and northern communities and a lot of communities where we have high unemployment, um, they're not in Metro Vancouver. Here in Metro Vancouver, people are worried about housing prices. So, uh, yes, we have the best economy in, in, the pro in the country. There's no question about that. But if people don't feel Feel, uh, and see the tangible benefits, mm -hmm. then you've got a problem. And yeah. when you have health care, education, <coughs> and housing affordability problems, you don't feel like you're ahead. I, I, I have a tendency to agree with Bill on that one. I think that the province in its entirety has often felt, whether we were in the 1990s and the bad times of economies or now in the best, which is which is odd, can British Columbians don't feel like they're getting ahead. So there has to be uh, there there has to be an understanding that if you're going to support a party that's going to increase your taxes significantly and hasn't costed that out, your vulnerability and liability, personal liability, mm -hmm. increases twofold. And so that's still again another argument. You may not like Christy Clark personally, but compared to where you would be under the NDP, NDP plan, which still has a lot of dark corners and shady corners to it, do, can you really trust that? And I don't mean shady, shady in the corners. young people way. <laughs> That's just to clarify. I'm too old to use that yeah, word. But now, yeah. uh, just I, I want to remind our audience uh, joining us tonight, we are with Elise Mills and Bill Tillman, NDP and Liberal Strategists respectively. We are taking your comments on Facebook, on CBC Vancouver Live. We will go live to the scrums that each of the leaders are going to be having in just a few minutes and if we happen to quickly dump out to those you'll want to hear their comments and the questions that they'll be asked of our many media colleagues who are all over the building here waiting to ask those questions what if anything stood out for any of these leaders for you tonight was there a singular moment that you went ah oh, that's interesting. Start with you, Bill. Uh, I thought John Horgan uh, made a really telling point when he said at the end of the debate on education, he just said, uh, you know, 16 years in power, mm -hmm. your legacy is people fundraising for textbooks. And, and, I, and he delivered it uh, perfectly to me. It was one of those points where he just, it stuck home, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, some of the other things we hear back and forth and people were spirited and, and as they should be. But I just thought that was one of those lines that hung out for me. Mm -hmm. mm. I, I, there were two for me with Christy Clark. Um, the first one was, no one wants John Horrigan as their landlord. I I really don't. I don't that Several yeah. layers I, in there. Okay. I, I yeah. love that yeah. one. Right. I think it really uh, it, it brings into focus like this very paternalistic sort of socialism side to how he wants to solve this problem, which is actually a market-driven problem. Uh, but the other, I think more importantly was, um, and I call this hashtag Pittsburgh box, bot, bot, piss, Pittsburgh bot Easy bosses. For you to say. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know what's going All on. Right. Long day. Uh, a long day, long day. We're heading into hour 15. But uh, she talks about how the boys in Pittsburgh, the Steeler, or the mm. U.S. Steel Workers Union, were the ones that stood beside Donald Trump to sign away Canadian and B.C. jobs, and yet these are the guys puppeteering John Horgan's campaign. That symbolizes the problem that the, U that the well, NDP it, has had with unions and labor it, and that complicated relationship that they have within their it, party. It symbolizes the liberal approach because it's not true. The steel workers represent woodworkers, mm -hmm. loggers, miners in this province who've been laid off, who've lost their jobs, and they're standing, and the reason they're supporting the NDP is because the Liberals have done such a poor job. So why job. are they supporting Donald Trump? They're not supporting Donald Trump. Then why did they stand and have their picture taken, shake hands while he's signing away Canadian and BC jobs specifically? Everyone seems to have a 
at least what they perceive as a very solid point of reference for that with that with with the liberals going after the NDP with having the steelworkers union beside Donald Trump who came up at least twice in this debate and the uh, idea about protectionism but at the same time and perhaps this is up, up to the point that uh, that Dr. Mr. Weaver made <laughs> another hashtag you can all look up <laughs> that he was saying that a week we have the NDP taking labor donations and we have the liberals taking corporate donations did he do an effective job of 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 having to uh, essentially well, attack from two it's, sides it's it's easier for him to say but they mm -hmm. took corporate donations they took fifty four thousand mm -hmm. dollars in corporate donations in 2013 he personally appealed on facebook for foreign donations and said they were unlimited from anywhere in the world mm -hmm. uh, and then got uh, upset with the liberals actually pointed it out not the ndp so you know there's a, an element of hypocrisy in this but yeah i mean if if you the, the green party is never going to get a lot of corporate money or a lot of union money so it's a fairly easy thing and mm -hmm. up until last year they were taking them. well mm -hmm. they they also i mean quite frankly they can tap into their their friends in the environmental movement the david suzuki foundation all those what i call and let's call them for what they are super PACs coming in from the u.s mm. uh but that transfer money. money just to be fair they no, can't give no, money no but, but he can tap okay. into support and he can mm. tap into the chair uh, all of that mm. um but i i do i don't think he define he makes his case the problem is is this is not his wheelhouse that he needs to be be in what mm. he needs to do is get out there and explain why he's a credible trusted economic uh leader in this mm. in this province the economy and the social sector are closely tied i don't think he seems to understand mm. that here is a bit of trivia that <laughs> pedram panahi would like to know has a leader ever stepped aside before an election let's assume that in bc go into the ethers of the of memory banks here. bill van der zam rita johnson am i right before oh, yeah. an election? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I mean, Glenn Clark would have decided. Perhaps they, what he, perhaps I think what he they means is, maybe we can get some yeah. clarification. Oh, yeah. like right before? In the middle of an election. No. I don't well, think so. And if they Not are in BC. In Manitoba, though, yeah. when the government was defeated, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Howard Pauley stepped down and Gary Dewar came in oh, just sorry, before, just before right, the yeah. election yeah. because the speaker, who was an NDP member, actually voted against the government and defeated mm -hmm. the government. So there's my trivia. Good for you, Bill. Do you win something? We're, we're, we're about to find out, apparently. <laughs> Perhaps yeah. if you'd like to send a gift to Bill, gift baskets <laughs> welcome. Why minute. make sure it's not Pinot Noir? Maybe we just an just emoji. Fine. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we also have people fact-checking. Fact-checking results. We heard that from all of the various yeah. media outlets that happened. Somebody said, I can't wait to see the fact-checking results for this debate. Was there a lot to go on? Anything new that, 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 you, that people could... could dive into on this well, or was this this kind of the same the as what they've heard? The, the Premier claimed that she had cut or the BC Liberal government had cut mm. child poverty rates in half. I don't believe that's factually correct. We'll mm. see what happens on that one. Certainly one that stuck out to me. Okay. I, yeah, um, the one that stuck out to me was actually the um, argument that Christy Clark poses to John Horrigan saying you've not brought up softwood lumber. Uh, well, the fact check there is that when you look at Hansard, he did in fact not bring up softwood lumber. He responded to Christy Clark announcing that um, the softwood lumber, lumber agreement was was moving into the lull, right? Mm. And this was back in the fall of the of 20, uh, 2016. Mm. So, and then he stands up and he congratulates her and says, I agree with you let's work together mm. that's all you hear from john horgan on softwood lumber so that would be one of the fact checks for me now would that just be in the context now that we are in the middle of an election and they don't want to appear to be getting along well it's interesting that john horgan either i mean he he's saying he has brought it up well he's obviously alluding to that one time in the house because and so he should have just said i brought it up because i agreed with you mm. <laughs> i agreed that we, you're i agree <laughs> that i'm going to work with you another question from susan saber who says when will the respect be back to let each one finish what they have to say without being interrupted by a bully i'm getting tired of this circus now is that it, it, it seemed to be a product of personalities perhaps performance and the format it is yeah it, it, sorry to yeah. interrupt you no 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 <laughs> by all means no but it, it, it is format if you want to go to classical <laughs> debate mm. style which we could do mm -hmm. sure. then y you just get your 30 seconds they get their 30 seconds mm -hmm. and and i actually think in some ways that would be better the problem you've got is and you've got strategists like at least tonight we were with former liberal and ndp strategists yeah. just in case yeah. uh, we don't want to yeah. take anyone's we, credit from the war but I mean, you're you're taught in the meet, in the training for debates and things that you you can't mm -hmm. let your opponent go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you never get your point across. So mm -hmm. you have to interrupt. How you do it without looking rude and and making bad television is a challenge. So in a lot of ways, uh, I throw it back to the media consortium and the format. Uh, 
if you design a format where both uh, two, two leaders or three leaders can go at it, you're going to get a lot of talking over, a lot of interruptions. Mm. Yeah, he's at, he ma Bill makes a really great point when you bring that up. I think it's a very difficult obstacle to try or mm. hurdle to try and jump. How do you not look rude? But I, I think I hear these comments every time we have a debate, every time we have an election. Oh, I don't like negative advertisement. Yeah. And But look what it happened worked. to Adrian Tix, mm -hmm. uh, Adrian Dix last yeah, time. Yeah. He didn't come in, he didn't get aggressive, they didn't put out negative ads, and people were like, that we had comments yeah. like that, but in the reverse. Mm -hmm. Why did they just stand there and let Christy Clark say that, mm -hmm. you know? So I think you're darned if you do and darned if you don't. Were you impressed by any of the leaders on the other side? Elise, what, what stood out for you? What did John Horgan and Andrew Weaver do well tonight? Uh, I, I think I'm going to I'm going to have to go with um, Andrew Weaver. I still think that I have a I, mm. I, I was a little offended by some of the things mm. that John Horgan said. And I'm not ready to let him off the hook, especially mm. about the Irish thing. That okay. was deeply personal, yeah. Dan. We have to interrupt for just a oh. moment. Sorry, apologies. We want to get into another question. Ryan Windsor also didn't like the format of the election of the, the election debate. Sometimes what? I don't like the format <laughs> of the election either. Touche. <laughs> <laughs> what did the panelists think of the questions in the format? We started with the formalities and the questions that were brought about by the consortium and, and, and um, political uh, pundits and experts in our province, but then we went to uh, the submissions from 1,300 people. How do you think it went, Bill? Uh, the questions were good. I thought a couple were repetitive. I think we got into software. Like what? We got into software a couple mm -hmm. times. We got into healthcare. There were some areas where I think we'd already covered the ground earlier on, not necessarily through the question, but through the answers that came out of it. So, mm -hmm. um, but I think overall it's good. I, I would have preferred to see videotape questions. I think it's kind of weird to see a TV debate where mm -hmm. you can't see the person. And I think we've seen in federal elections where they've actually taped questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that's much better. You see the person asking the question, and it's harder to to not answer the question as well. Puts a human face. Exactly. Too. Elise, what do you I, think? I think for people like Bill and I, I absolutely agree with Bill. It was repetitive. Um, we saw that also on the affordability slash housing. There, affordability isn't simply just housing in this province, right? Affordability is also tied to others. And I, we got into this re repetitive situation where it was just about housing, just about housing. Well, there's only so many w ways you can answer that question. Then you're getting into conversations that actually sort of sort of evoke these ideas of socialism and government intervention. And, and then it just got kind of weird. If you want to talk about affordability, I'm excited to talk about jobs and um, salaries, for example, and how they compare with the rest of Canada. That would be more interesting to me. I'm not so sure my girl would have done as well as maybe a John Horgan on that. But at least we would have had um, a clashing, um, and 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 each leader could have definitely carved out their position. But yeah, I found some of it to be repetitive. I'm not sure, so sure what the audience thought, but mm. this to me has is not my favorite debate that I've mm. seen in the time I've been involved in politics. And we are asking our audience on Facebook Live to join us with your questions and comments. And just a warn, uh, just a caution for you. Andrew Weaver is going to be up first with his news conference. We're going to be standing by for that. If we dump out to that very quickly, apologies. We want to get to more of your comments. Uh, we have Brad Fisher just before uh, Andrew Weaver begins, who says, "I thought the format was great and showed what these people are like under pressure." In a performance <laughs> sense, perhaps. Bill, I mean, what about that? that well, they you're perform, seeing us under pressure, too, and this yeah, is what we're like. You this know? is true. <laughs> this is us. So and, anytime, and, anytime, and it's going very well so far. <laughs> we like the Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> and, and, anytime you're on television answering, answering tough questions uh, with a huge audience and, and everything's at stake, you're under huge pressure. You can't put much more pressure on unless you do something like cut through a kitchen and make them stand on balls or something. You know, it's kind of... That's, we weren't that's insured for that. Just believe me, having, <laughs> believe yeah. me having, having worked with a premier before a debate, it is intensely, intensely high pressure. Well, you've both done that and, uh, to a certain extent with, with, with either premiers or, or, or high profile candidates. At least what goes into that prep? Uh, that, well, it, it begins weeks and okay. weeks. It's oh. time to go to Andrew Weaver. Apologies, here's Andrew Weaver. Oh, there she is, okay. I'll just wait for Julia. Yeah. So uh, you were criticizing the radio debate for not being more interactive and mixing it up and also not going after the NDP. Do you think those criticisms were valid? Because you certainly seem to have a completely different approach. Well, actually, I respected the format of the first debate during the first debate. The first debate, we were specifically told that there would be no talking over and that if you wanted to have attention, you were to actually indicate to Mr. Good. And, and the other two leaders did not follow the instructions we were given. This debate, I also followed the instructions. I respected the time we were allocated to ourselves, but when we actually had the clash, 
That's when you clash. And so I had an opportunity to clash directly, which such an opportunity didn't provide, prevent it, uh, you know, pre present itself last time. But you went after Borgen tonight without even mentioning it last time. That was a shift, that was a shift in, obviously a shift in You know, I, I was, I, it was a great debate. I was uh, trying to, we got to specific chances. We're designed to ask questions. I think you'll see that I challenged both of them on their, on their, on their platforms. I challenged both of them on their statements. And, and the, I was presented the opportunity to do so directly in this one. Uh, so whether, whether it was a, a, a strategy or not, I, I mean, it was the opportunity was there uh, because we were supposed to clash. So I, I, I really enjoyed the debate. It was, uh, it was really, you know, it was actually a lot of fun because it was uh, really great questions um, and it was uh, inspiring to be there. Were you, when you asked him whether he was going to get angry at you, you seemed to be piling on this issue of, of Mr. Corgan's temperament. Do you think that's a legitimate issue for the campaign or were you just having Oh, you know, we were having a heated debate, and, and we were having a, a debate on issues, and, and, you know, we were just debating the issues. It was a great debate. You know, Mr. Horgan did a great debate. Ms. Clark did a great debate. I was having fun in a great debate, and, and I think it was. I think, you know, I've, I've had feedback already that people found it, found it interesting. They found it, uh, you know, fun to watch, enjoyable to watch, getting to understand what the issues were and seeing the different leaders' perspectives on it. So, so it was, you know, you can ask him that, but I, I, I thought it was a good debate. Um, to Justine's point, you said it a couple of times to uh, John that are you going to get angry at me now, John? Throughout the campaign, you said that you've not, you weren't going to get personal. What was the strategy behind saying? Well, there, you know, when you're standing there, again, it was a good debate, but when you're standing there, um, you, you may not see the, the same body uh, language and body reactions that I saw. So I, I, it, to me, it was, uh, you know, a little question that I, I asked, but I was really focused on the debate because what mattered was the debate was key. It was, uh, it was exciting. It was vibrant. It was, it was uh, you know, f policy based. I, I think, uh, you know, the debate is, speaks for itself. What body language did you see that you're referring to? Well, I mean, I, I don't know specific. You know, when, you're when I'm talking to you now, um, you, you're standing there and, and, and we know how, how you're feeling when we talk. And when you're standing next to somebody who's clearly not pleased with what you're saying, and, and, and you can tell based on the body language, you know, it's not uh, the, how a person is feeling or reacting. And so, you know, for me, again, what's important, though, is, is the debate. The debate was important. The issues were important. We discussed the issues, you know, and it was a great opportunity to challenge both John Horgan and Christy Clark on the action issues. Where do you go from here now, Andrew? What's the focus as we get out of the debate and into the last uh, two weeks of the campaign? Well, we have, uh, you know, t tomorrow I have an all-candidates in the riding uh, at some time. Uh, I'm going to be heading up to, it's, it's time blurs when you're on a campaign, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, I believe I'm also, I, I believe we're around the Oak Bay Gordon Head area in Victoria tomorrow with the bus. Um, I, I don't know what's happening on Friday. I believe I'm up in Parksville on Saturday. Saturday, I believe I'm going to the, to the Okanagan on Sunday. I, I, I am going to the Okanagan on Sunday, and I'm going to be uh, uh, going to all around there, around Kamloops. So now it's time to go off around the, uh, the province. I meant more holistically in terms of approach. Is there a different approach you take now that you're out of the debate and kind of get on the stretch? Well, I'll tell you, preparing for the debate is a big thing. So obviously, this is nice to have this behind us, because now you know, I can focus specifically on working you know, to, to talk with people on a one-to-one, -one, not worrying about this looming debate, to, to talk about the issues. Um, and, and I'm excited to do that. So it's, there's no real strategy. We've, we've been doing the same thing. You know, our, our message, I think we have an inspiring message of a new economy that people will get behind if they, if they have the opportunity to see it. And so I'm going out with my candidates, our candidates, to, to, to try to get people to understand what we stand for, you know, what our, what our platform is, what our policies are, because we think it really resonates. Look, we had uh, Lindsay Ted, um, Ted's who just recently an economist basically said, you know, your platform is the you, is, is as if you are running for the economist party. Party. We have very senior economists who've been looking at our platform to ensure that it is costed realistically, to ensure that it actually. And we've actually been told by independent third parties that we're conservative in our costing, and, and, and that some of our expected revenues are underestimates. So we're really proud of our platform, and it's a question about priorities, and we just have to get that message out to British Columbians because I think we have a chance to do a lot of uh, a lot here in the election. Yes, Andrew, do you feel more like a politician after that debate and less of a political insider? Less than a what? Less of a political outsider, I should say. Well, the format that was set up and the fact we had to follow the format 
was actually um, very, you know, I, I was very pleased with. In the, for, in the former debate, we had a format that the other two leaders did not follow, and so I was criticized by some in the media for not interjecting myself into the debate. But, but that, you know, again, we were given rules, and I was following those rules, and, and where the other two weren't. Here we were given rules, and we all followed those rules. And so that allowed more interjection, more clash, more discussion with the... With Level. You've always been a political outsider at this stage, oh. but the scientist who decided to run because he felt he had to. But now tonight, it appears that you've sort of debated and you've you got your hands dirty to some extent as far as uh, making a, making a point that you made tonight. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know that there's a change. I felt very comfortable in this role. Look, as a, as a as a scientist, a climate scientist. The kind of stuff I had to deal with as a climate scientist on the front lines of climate science, uh, this pales in comparison to the to, to kind of the, the what, what's out there when you're a climate scientist. So I found the transition relatively straightforward and easy. I, I do believe there's such an opportunity here for people to talk about policy. You know, when you look at um, the other leaders when they're in the debate, Ms. Clark stuck right onto the same theme: jobs, 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 which she has no credibility on. And Mr. Horgan would would spend his time criticizing Ms. Clark without ever offering a solution. Like like he would just go on and not offer a solution and criticize Clark. We, and, and you'll see in our, my answers, the BC Green believe in finding solutions to problems. So I would focus on the question and answer the question at the same time as, you know, clashing across um, with the other, uh, other two positions. So I think it's, it's a natural role. Look, we have six, PH, six PhD scientists and another, it'll be seven on our team. 20% you know, of our team are teachers. You know, we have an exciting team ready to, 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 to go forward. There was a suggestion from Mr. Morgan in there you've heard before that you're just a vote for the Liberals, basically. You'll vote for the Greens yeah. because of folks in the Liberals. How much more do you expect to hear that Probably. over the next uh, couple of weeks? And do you think there's any potential it, it picks up any type of traction? No, because it backfires. We know it backfires. If this argument, if, they, if Mr. Horgan believes this argument, then he should be telling all the people on Vancouver Island who support the NDP to vote for the Greens. And the reason why, of course, is we're leading on Vancouver Island, and we've led for several weeks in a row, according to the mainstream research polls. Uh, so, so it's a pretty shallow argument, and it's actually an offensive argument, because it implies that the vote is uneducated, that the voter is unable to make up their mind as to who they should vote for. It implies that somehow he is, owns a vote, whereas the voters, you know, British Columbians know what they're doing. And I trust British Columbians to vote for who they want, vote for something instead of against something. It's clear that that message is backfiring for him because in, rather than spending the time that he could to offer a vision that people could get behind, his narrative is basically, you know, vote for us because you hate them. Well, that's not, a, that's not an exciting uh, uh, a narrative. And people, you know, they, they, this is similar to the, the campaign they ran last time. So I, I'm not worried about that. And frankly, um, uh, I, I, the polling that you see from Main Street suggests that we need, needn't be worried about that. Our support is firming up. You see that in Main Street research, such that people who say they'll vote green are now going to vote green no matter what. And that has increased dramatically over the last few weeks. Who do you see as your main rival in your winnable seats in the days ahead? And what specifically are you going to do to build on any momentum you may have gotten? Well, well, clearly, um, in, the, in the Okanagan, our main rival is, are the BC Liberals. Clearly, in Kamloops, our main rival is the BC Liberals. Cle Absolutely. Clearly, on the Sunshine Coast, it will be uh, the BC NDP. Clearly, um, you know, on, on, on southern Vancouver Island, it's the BC NDP. Clearly, in Parksville Qualicum, it's the BC Liberals. So, so we know that, you know, we also know, and Main Street Research uh, attests this, that we're everybody's second choice. We know that from the Main Street research polling. We're everybody's second choice and a lot of people's first choice, which means because of the fact that there are three political parties and because of the fact that 45% of British Columbians have not voted, there's a very real possibility for us to win a ton of seats across British Columbia. Uh, this will be the final question. Andrew, did you hear John Horgan say that the NDP was going to lose the election? No, what, what, what I thought I heard was he said, and the BC Liberals are going to win this election. I thought I heard him say that. You, know, you go back and check the sound button on that. And then I looked to the Premier, Christy Clark, and I said, did he just say that? And, and, and that's, that's what I thought I heard. Um, he said that the BC Liberals are going to win this election because. It's like, like you're blaming. Uh, it, it, have a look at the, you'll have to listen to the sound on that. That's what I thought I heard. And uh, you, I know the media will go back and look at it, and you, you can ask him. And I can't Thank believe Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, Mr. Horgan is going to be next. Thank you very much.
There's Andrew Weaver, leader of the Green Party, giving his analysis post-debate. And we're waiting for John Horgan to come out, but if we have a little time, we're going to reintroduce our guests. Elise Mills, former Liberal strategist, Bill Thielman, NDP strategist. Now, we are going to be taking more of your comments and questions, and we're going to dive right in now. Somebody's saying, here we are. Uh, actually, we have a question from Jeremy O'Twig wondering about why is the CBC doing post-debate analysis with political strategists affiliated with the two front-runner parties? Why not have neutral pundits? I will field that one for you, Jeremy. We come to these people because they have insight, because they have analysis, because they have experience. They can tell us what's going on in the back room. Hope that gives you some insight. And they also have connections. And so we can sometimes get insights that perhaps we wouldn't get from other neutral parties. Let's go to another question. We're the, uh, here we are. Brian Windsor wonders, also didn't like the format of the question. Oh, sorry, we already went through that there. Let's see here. There we are. Matt Masks asks, says on Horgan, What's wrong with being angry? It shows passion. Is that being, are there, is this being played up too much? I know you mentioned the Irish thing. Is that being made up too much? Well, I, I, I think it is, and I also think we've seen in the United States mm -hmm. a very angry candidate uh, triumphed over all others, first in a primary, the Republicans, Donald Trump, and then uh, in the presidential race. So we have to, you know, kind of understand, and people do mm -hmm. get angry. Politics brings out a lot of emotion in people. Mm -hmm. I think it is overdone. I, I do think that uh, a, a relatively minor circumstance in a radio debate has been made into a mole, from a mountain to mm -hmm. or a molehill to a mountain. So I don't think it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, John Horgan's having a hard time differentiating between the U.S. and Canada a mm -hmm. lot. I mean, I, the whole thing with the steel workers still baffles me. I mean, and it feeds into this narrative like, we very much, Canada has a very different political climate than the U.S. Mm -hmm. does. I mean, angry men don't normally do well in Canada, Canadian mm -hmm. politics. And mm -hmm. people like myself and Bill work very hard to soften or to uh, build confidence in areas that there is lacking confidence, which can also create anger. Mm -hmm. And that could be John Horgan's uh, experience. It could be mm -hmm. that, he, that he, in some areas... And lacks. it's time for Horgan, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. There he is. So did you first question, sorry. All right, John, I'm gonna read you a quote from the debate. Most corporate funded party in BC history is going to win next election because they've taken big piles of money. Did you really say the BC Liberals are going to win the next election? That would, that would be put down to a misspeak, I would think. Uh, I don't want the most corporate funded party in BC to win the next election, would have been how I would have said that. And what uh, comes next? Coming out of tonight, this is over. Where does your focus shift now? as it all has always been, talking to British Columbians about how we can make a better BC, talking to British Columbians and people about their lives being better. This is not as good as it gets. Christy Clark wants people to believe. She wants them to forget the past 16 years and believe that somehow now, with two weeks left in an election campaign, you can believe her. I don't think British Columbians are going to accept that. Given that Andrew Weaver basically ignored in the radio debate, were you taking the back by his uh, no, I, uh, I accomplished what I wanted to do tonight, and that was to talk to British Columbians about my plan and my vision and how I want to approach uh, politics and government and making life better for British Columbians. Mr. Weaver was beside me, and I was good with that. Justine? I just in the, that exchange with Mr. Weaver, he kept asking you, are you going to get angry at me? And the Premier kept talking about the need to stay calm. Did you feel like people were kind of, you were even asked about it by the moderator, do you feel like people were kind of dogpiling on you around your temperament? Uh, well, again, this is something for those who know me uh, in the gallery. We've had a long relationship, and, and I, uh, I feel passionate about issues, and, and that's why I got involved in public life in the first place. So I'm, uh, I'm quite happy uh, with myself. I'm quite happy with my space, and I'm pleased with how, uh, how the, the debate went tonight. Uh, what other political leaders want to talk about, what they want to focus on is their business. Tonight, I wanted to talk, talk to people directly about help being on the way and that there is a better way to proceed. We don't have to just listen to the, the corporate backers in the BC Liberal back room. We can talk about how we can make life better for people. Rob? Yeah, you burned off a lot of time. Uh, directly debating Andrew Weaver and talking over each other to the point where I don't think a lot of people heard what either of you were saying. Did that accomplish what you set out to do? And, and what do you think of the amount of time you spent debating Weaver instead of Clark? Well, I think we, the, the layout of the debate uh, required us to ask each of the other leaders two questions. So there were four opportunities to do that, two to Ms. Clark and two to Mr. Weaver. So that was the layout of the debate. What I liked about this debate was the opportunity to hear questions from 
uh, the consortium or those represented here in the scrum and, and also from regular citizens. The, the back and forth, what I enjoyed about that is I asked Ms. Clark, I gave her an opportunity to apologize to a generation of kids who she robbed of a good education, a quality education, and she refused to do that. Did you really think she would? Well, again, uh, she did leave a voicemail for me once when she was wrong, uh, so it was an opportunity for her. Uh, but uh, look, she spent 16 years uh, spending millions of dollars on courtrooms that could have gone into classrooms. I would have thought that this would have been an opportunity for her. Instead, she continued on with bluster. Finger? Uh, John, you took a fire from both your opponents in terms of union uh, donations to your party. Um, how well do you think that you've ended that off? And do you think that's going to maybe your position is going to hurt you in the long run? No, I don't think so. I think we've been absolutely clear about this. And again, I, I, you're member from the gallery. You know that we've raised this issue repeatedly six times. We've tabled legislation, and I've made a commitment. We, as a party, have made a commitment in four successive election campaigns to ban big money, and that's exactly what we're going to do. But I'm not going to play by someone else's rules when the BC Liberals are playing in the wild, wild west. I appreciate that that's it's difficult for some people to get their heads around, but this goes to Mr. Zuzman's question. They're the most corporate-funded party British Columbia has ever seen, and if I'm going to be successful, I have to go at them on the a level playing field, and if I get the, the backing of the people of British Columbia with a plan that will make life better for them, the first order of business is to take big money out of politics. Over here. Uh, Mr. Morgan, uh, let's go back to this uh, uh, steel worker thing. Uh, do you think that some electors will be turned up? by this uh, uh, steel worker thing, A, and B, we have seen historically some parties refusing to, uh, refusing to, uh, to accept union and, uh, union and corporate donation, yeah. and those parties, I'm taking up the PQ, went, got, got into power in less than 60 years. Uh, well, again, uh, I, think, I think you would, you would know better than I, but as a student of Canadian federalism, there were a whole bunch of issues involved in the PQ coming to power that did not involve union and corporate donations. So I think that's, I don't believe that applies here. Yeah, Mr. Horgan, uh, you might know that the City of Vancouver and Mayor Robertson have proposed a phasing out of fossil fuel use in the city. Is this something you'd like to see across the province? And is it really possible to get to a fossil fuel free future without projects like the Site C Dam? Well, uh, again, I believe that the Site C Dam, for example, is something that the only project that BC Hydro has built since uh, the 1980s that has not required an independent assessment by the BC Utilities Commission. And why that's important is that BC Hydro officials have to be subjected to cross-examination. They're asked about the assumptions they make and the forecasts for the future. And that's why it's so critically important. And that's why the BC Liberals didn't want to go there. So do you think new hydroelectric projects could be part of the mix in the future as we phase out fossil fuels and look to more electric cars, things like that? We have a plan called uh, Power BC that focuses on bringing on new sources of, of alternative energy, alternatives to the 1950s uh, dam approach by investing in wind and solar and geothermal and a whole range of issues that will create jobs in every corner of British Columbia. I'm, uh, uh, you may know I was the energy spokesperson for the opposition for a decade. I feel very strongly about these issues and that's where I want to go with energy in BC. Uh, Farah? We heard Christy Clark say a couple times during the debate that uh, you haven't brought up the issue of softwood uh, lumber at all during the legislature. Can you clarify that? Well, uh, again, I, I invite you to go and look at Hansard. We have a caucus of 35 people, uh, and we've had forest critics for the entire time I've been in the legislature, and I have not been the forest critic. And we have asked questions about raw log exports, about softwood lumber, and about the challenges in our forest industry all the time. The fact that Ms. Clark's never there is probably why she didn't hear any of those questions. Okay. Any further? Thank you. Thank you so much. See you on the road. John Horgan speaking there after the debate. Looking, sounding confident, seemed pleased with his performance, talked about his plan to ban big money out of politics. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, you are on CBC Vancouver Facebook Live. We're with Elise Mills, former Liberal strategist, and Bill Thielman, ND, former NDP strategist. Uh, what did you make of what John Horgan had to say about the debate performance? He seemed to 
like that back and forth. Bill, what about that? Yeah, he did. I thought he sounded very confident mm -hmm. at the scrum. Uh, I thought Andrew Weaver sounded fairly confident for most of his scrum before that as well. In fact, I was surprised at the difference in tenor between uh, Mr. Weaver's uh, on air and, the, and he was pretty agitated during the debate. And he's more likable when he's a little calmer. I, I think mm -hmm. everyone is practically. Uh, John did, a, I mean, he has every reason to, to feel confident. I think he did a great job. And, and the, you know, I, I'm not the right person to make that judgment, but I will uh, from that perspective. I thought he did a, a very good job on it. And I think he'll get a boost out of this in the polls afterwards. I mean, that'll be the real test uh, for all three leaders. Did you get a boost in the polls after this debate? Do you go up or not? And I think John will go up. Mm. At least, what about what you took away from what he t what, what he said there? Well, he's a brilliant spinner. I mean, I've got to give uh, John Horgan credit because he is a good match against Christy Clark in regards to the rumble in the jungle, in the ring. You know, they're good street fighters. Um, he has he has some uh, a lot of the same uh, tactics I think that Christy does in her debate style. Uh, but what I found so curious is he's talking about the softwood lumber uh, line that the premier used on him, which is, you know, now that it's an election, you, this is suddenly an issue. And he says, yeah, I brought it. I brought it up. Check Hansard. Well, we have checked Hansard. And October the 7th, 2016, when the premier announces to the House, uh, because she was there, says, look, you know, we're going into probably a, a trade dispute over softwood lumber. He stands to congratulate her and says, let's work together. That was the only reference but good for John you know and but I do agree with uh, Bill he is much better when he's calmer he looked absolutely relieved in the scrum relieved that he was out of the pen out of the pit right so. and one of the questions he was asked and we're standing by for, for uh, Liberal leader Christy Clark so if we cut to that forgive us you'll be able to hear all of her comments uh, the question that Richard Zussman asked him was where do we go from here and all mm -hmm. he said was we're back on the campaign trail focusing on making life more affordable uh, Let's go to Andrew Weaver's uh, post-debate scrum. He seemed to think that he, he actually didn't mind uh, the, the format of it. He thought it was a good debate. Didn't, he preferred it over the last time. Um, he was asked about whether or not a vote for him is a vote for the Liberals in terms of this vote splitting, perception of vote splitting on the left. What about that, Bill? Uh, he clearly was, used the word clearly several times, you know, clearly in this region and this region. So he was a little uh, unhappy with that question. Uh, I've said before on our program, it's the third party squeeze. It always happens. And it doesn't matter what the third party is. He's going to be under the, the pinchers of pressure from voters who decide either they have decided they want to get rid of this government or they want to keep it. And uh, opposition will coalesce mm -hmm. around one party or the other. And not Time the for Liberal Leader Christy Clark. Okay, I'm glad you do. <laughs> um, on the issue of child poverty, you see yes. it's down 50%. Uh, but the numbers that we see in Stats Canada show the poverty rate is higher than the national average, uh, and it's decreased from 25.3% to 19.8%. So how can you say that it's gone down 50%? Well, we're talking about child poverty in the province, and this is for the, from 2000, the statistic is from 2001 until today. So it's really comparing it to the year that the NDP was last in power. And the way we're making sure that we are reducing child poverty in the province, and we do have a lot more work to do, is by making sure that we create jobs in the province, that we cut taxes so that people have more money in their pocket, we keep government small, that's how we make sure that people find their way out of poverty. And projects like the Single Parent Employment Initiative to make sure that people find their way from social assistance to work are also making a big contribution to that. So, um, you know, the, the, the numbers are Statistic Canada numbers and we can go over it a little bit afterward um, if you'd like. And Rob, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to do now that. that. Now that the debate's over, does the campaign change? What, what happens now that tonight is done? Campaign, um, I'm going to go back to what I was doing before tonight, and including tonight, which is talking to British Columbians about our plan to cut taxes, control government spending, and to make sure we're creating jobs. That's what I've been doing from day one of the campaign, and that's what I'm going to continue to do. I did that tonight, um, and I tried to stay focused on that, despite all of the... Um, the yelling and spending that was going on by the gentleman in the room. But I'm going to continue to do that for the next 14 days because I think most British Columbians want to know. I mean, there's only one party with a plan. And um, I think, you know, tonight and in the next few days, people are going to want to, um, uh, you know, make their decisions about who they vote for. Rob Shaw. The, uh, you made a reference in there to the uncertainty caused by Donald Trump, and you're the only strong leader who can, who can handle that at this time. But we're, I think voters are going to respond to this idea that 
you were the only one who could somehow take on Donald Trump, that, that, that it's up to you? Or? Well, I mean, here's the thing, is on the stage tonight, um, you know, we had one leader in the NDP who was talking, who, you know, who has turtled on softwood lumber. He never even raised it in question period once in the three years that he's been leader. And, you know, he's asked questions on a whole range of question, of issues in other ministries. Um, but this one never made it up to the top of his priority list. I have been, you know, we've appointed a softwood emissary in David Emerson. We are t um, going to be establishing a permanent office in Washington to work on the softwood lumber deal. I have been to Washington and I have been to Ottawa many times to work with the federal negotiators who are the ones who are at the table for us. So I think, you know, I think the other thing though is a question of who is the leader that people are going to trust to be tough, strong at the table and determined but who's also going to be able to make sure that we are um, calm and under control so that we can make sure that we get the best deal for British Columbia? Because you don't, you don't uh, negotiate trade deals with the Americans by losing your temper. Justine. You just brought up the word calm again. I lost track of how many times you mentioned that in 90 minutes. What were you getting at? Well, I, you know, I mean, I... The thing for me is I, leadership needs to be patient, it needs to be calm, and it needs to be determined. That's the, you know, that's how, um, how you make sure you get the job done. We've had a jobs plan since 2011. It's created 226,000 jobs in the province. We've added 10,000 jobs to forestry in the time since we introduced the jobs plan. And we're going to continue to focus on that. And the only way you can focus on a plan is if you stay calm and you stay determined. And um, you know, that, so that's what I was talking about tonight. You're, you're directing that at somebody in the room who probably wasn't at the moderator. Right? I was directing it at British Columbians. And tonight was a chance for British Columbians to see each of us, to see how we conduct ourselves, but also to understand a little bit about our character and to learn about the plans that we have. And our party is the only party with a plan to control spending, cut taxes, and make sure that we're creating jobs. Just a coincidence that you were sort of repeating this thing from the last one. Did it work well for you in that last, in that radio debate, talking to Mr. Horgan about calming down? You know, in a debate, um, in this debate, I wasn't talking to anybody but British Columbians. And that's what debates are always supposed to be about, making sure we're talking to the people that are going to vote and giving them the best idea about what it is we believe in and who we are as leaders. So that's what I was trying to do tonight. Um, a lot of the messages we heard from you tonight were around jobs and the economy and staying the course. A lot of the questions from the public, though, seem to be about social services, about um, you know kids in care, kids aging out of care, um, healthcare wait times, and the like. Um, do you see a disconnect, perhaps, between your message and what the public wants to know, or where do you think those two issues? Are? I think if the debate had uh, been at the end of the ten years of New Democrats, there would have been a lot of questions about jobs in the economy. And, you know, the economy is going well, and I, th I, I think most British Columbians know that. 226,000 new jobs that have been created in the province. And um, so I think, I think British Columbians are feeling more confident about where the economy is going because it's growing than they have in a long time. And so that means that we're also talking about other questions. Um, but, you know, the fact is... The only way that we can make sure that we look after people who are vulnerable and who need us is if the economy is growing. And I made the point tonight that under the NDP government, because they ran out of money, they didn't build a single hospital, they cut 1,600 nursing positions, and they didn't train a single new, uh, they didn't open a new training space for doctors. That was devastating for the people in British Columbia. So for me, it starts with a strong economy and controlling spending and cutting taxes and creating jobs. And that's what allows us to look after all of those other things like cutting child poverty by 50%. Rebel. Uh, regarding your decision to write to Prime Minister Trudeau today. Rebel media. Yes. Regarding your decision to write to Mr. Trudeau today, Prime Minister Trudeau, did you consider requesting uh, tariffs on U.S. coal first rather than an outright ban? Uh, my, my plan was to ask the federal government to do an outright ban. And if they... Uh, weren't up for it. We were going to we were going to be prepared 
to uh, introduce a levy, which would have been in our power to do so. But you know, the thing is, is that the ban isn't just on U.S. coal, or thermal coal, it's on all dirty thermal coal. This is something that American states have been doing from California to Washington to Oregon. So we're joining them in doing that, fighting climate change. But for us uniquely, because we produce a lot of clean metallurgical coal here, it's going to create jobs for British Columbians because it'll open up more space to be able to move that coal to China. How worried are you about job losses? Uh due to this and how ready is the metallurgical coal industry to step in? I think, you know, I think that they uh, are ready to take it on. And, you know, I'm a lot more concerned about BC jobs than American jobs. And those jobs in the Kootenays, for example, where they're producing this clean metallurgical coal, the jobs that will be created because there's more space um, to make sure that we ship it, those are worth a lot more to British Columbia because they pay taxes in our province. And every bit of that coal that gets shipped pays royalties to the people of British Columbia. None of that American coal creates uh, long-term jobs in British Columbia for people in mining, and none of it creates royalties for the people of British Columbia. So that's what I'm focused on. To me, it's part of a jobs plan. You mentioned that if uh, the Prime Minister would not take action, the province of British Columbia would. What would we do if, uh, if the Prime Minister declined to ban thermal coal? We, we do have some, we have some powers to be able to levy a fee. Um, but, you know, I think the Prime Minister is going to say, join us in doing this. Because he's concerned about climate change. He's concerned about jobs. So am I. Uh, Radio Canada. Uh, Mrs. Clark. Hello. How are you? Good, thank you. Uh, tell me. Uh, you are Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> you are very critical towards the... Steve Worker and Mr. Hogan. He was very critical, I would say, toward your party and its donors. Is it the proof that this system is broken and you would need to follow the example of the rest of the country and ban uh, union and corporations' donations? We need to change the system. So I did talk about that a little bit tonight, which is, at, and we are going to, should we be elected, um, and you know, I don't want to prejudge who's going to get elected. Um, but if we get elected, what we're going to do is ask an independent commission to tell us how we reform political fundraising in British Columbia. And the reason to do that is because politicians, each of us who has an avid interest in trying to make sure the fundraising system works for the individual party, should not be making these rules. They should be made um, and recommended to us by, a, by an independent body. What are you expecting this this body to found something else that have been found in the federal government and the rest of the of the country? I mean, they will come with what seems to be the more logical and the more answers to that question. That big money doesn't belong to politics. Well, you know what I would say in Ontario and Quebec, they've settled on a system where taxpayers are funding political parties where money is going from health care and education into the coffers of New Democrats and Liberals and others. That is wrong. I do not agree with that. So whatever recommendation that we get, we are not going to follow that part of the federal example or the Ontario example because people want their tax money to go to health care and things like that. But they already, they already uh, uh, finance the political party since it's yeah. tax deductible. So there's a party, a part of the money that comes from the taxpayer, mm -hmm. indirectly. Mm -hmm. But not the $100 million that the federal government has diverted for over the years, or, or this year, based on a long-term policy. The, federal, the $100 million that they have diverted from investing in health care, from investing in environmental protection, from investing in, all, in tax cuts, they've spent that going, giving it to political parties. And I don't think British Columbians are up for that. Last question. Last, Sabu, question. last question, middle of the room. Uh, yeah, returning to the debate, you seem to engage uh, Andrew Weaver quite a bit at the start, and I'm wondering that took attention away from um, John Horgan. Is it an, a, an attempt, a ploy to uh, take some oxygen away from the NDP and maybe even split the progressive vote? We had to ask two questions of each leader, and I did that in the course of the debate. And but you know, I am. I am only focused on talking to the people of British Columbia in these debates and making sure that they get a feel for where I stand. And that is, we are the only party with a plan to control government spending. We don't believe in bigger government. We believe in a bigger economy. We're the only people with a plan to cut taxes. And we see a $6 billion tax hike potentially from the NDP. And we are the only party to support job creation in British Columbia. 
Both the NDP and the Greens have plans that would kill jobs in every single corner of the province. And they've been working to kill jobs for many years and both of their platforms confirm that. I think um, that's what British Columbians tuned in to see, not all the yelling and spending that was going on with the other guys. I think they wanted to know where we stand on things, and so that was what I was focused on. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, right, everybody. Thank Premier, who, who really pays for your house? Will you show us your text? The final scrum from Liberal leader Christy Clark, and now time for some analysis with our guests, Elise Mills, former Liberal strategist, Bill Thielman, former NDP strategist, and the hardest working man in show business, <laughs> Richard Zussman, our Legislative Bureau Chief at CBC, British Columbia. Elise, to you first off, what did you hear from the Premier that stood out in that post-debate scrum? I, I heard uh, a, a relieved Premier, as I heard <laughs> with all the leaders, that they were relieved to get out of there. Um, that's a high-pressure situation, as Bill was saying as well. I think that uh, she was very confident, she was calm, I mean, surprised calm and measured when she comes out of that type of as we talked about sort of like rumble in the jungle you know that's hard to come down from um, but she gave I thought some uh, more detail to her policy uh, uh, planks uh, specifically around the economy softwood lumber and the response the initiative through thermal uh, coal mm -hmm. um, and, and and some of the reasons why she wants to do that as well I think she's also like when she said uh, she's gonna go toe-to-toe -to -toe on this one I think I'm feeling the frustration from the Premier that she's sort of been, uh, that the, the Prime Minister hasn't done what he needed to do, even though she's asked him repeatedly. Mm. And that began, honestly, when we saw Trudeau come to Vancouver for the first time for the First Minister's meeting. I know Brad Wall, ha for the Premier from Saskatchewan, had that same frustration on oil and gas mm. and pipelines as well. All right. Bill, anything that stood out to you from that scrum? A relieved well, Premier? Yeah, clearly relieved. I mean, everyone is after a debate like that. The Premier is a, look, she's a walking message box. I mean, she, she's very good at it. She's a good campaigner. She continually goes back to what she's been told to say. We saw a new a new line, yelling and spending, yeah. and, and she used it twice. Just in twice. Case, in, case, in case she yeah. missed it, she <laughs> used it twice. Well, we thought it was because a flop. That's, that's what she does. Really. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I didn't think there was anything particular out of it, but mm -hmm. she repeated her mm -hmm. themes, and that's what she does. Richard, you were in the room for all three of those scrums. Yeah. Did we learn anything new? Any I mean, did they all, let's start off with the relieved factor. Did they all look relieved? Yeah, you heard it best from Andrew Weaver. I think it was a question I asked. I can't remember all the way back to 30 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he said that this is, it's a lot of work preparing mm, for yes, these debates. Yes, yes. And it's this tremendous relief now that it's over. He seemed the most relieved, I think, just in his words, but you, you mentioned it, the body language, right? They all indicated that now they get to go back on the road. They get to meet with people one-on-one. -on -one. That's what they want to do. They get to talk about their issues. They don't have to be challenged anymore. So I think there was a tremendous sense of relief. I think to what Christy Clark was saying, the liberal leader, she drops these lines always. Bill was sort of mentioning it. everything she says is on purpose. So she was talking many times in the debate about how you have to be calm. A leader needs to be calm. And then when she was asked directly mm. about in the scrum, oh, I wasn't talking about John Horgan. How could I be talking about John <laughs> Horgan? I'm just talking about people being calm. So obviously she does that on purpose. It's hard to buy a little bit what she was mm. saying on the calm factor. Clearly it is directed towards Horgan. And we saw him, I didn't hear everything you guys were saying about his performance tonight, but there wasn't the sort of moment like last time where he clearly lost his cool. I think mm -hmm. he was aggressive at times. He did use that line he's used lots of times with, for many people, is very effective, which is how could you not be angry with the child poverty rates we're seeing or welfare rates not going up. But clearly he still had some issues with going overboard a little bit. It was provoked a bit by Andrew Weaver in that debate, which I think does bother him when that I, happens. I thought it was interesting that he, so the point that you're talking about where he says, look, I'm not an angry man because he's asked about anger management. Can he keep his anger right. in check? And, and that is important for British Columbians to know because we're just talking about all the top line issues right now. We're talking about trade. We're talking about the economy. You need to have a measured response and good for Christy Clark for throwing a little snark in there. I mean, we all knew what it meant. But then it, snark, as but soon as he, <laughs> he defends that he doesn't have this anger management problem, poor Andrew Weaver I mean, you know, if it was a cartoon, it would have been like, you know, his face through a wind tunnel. It would just be John Horgan yelling over him, right? And I just think if you're going to say you're not an angry man, you can't play an angry man on TV and then pretend that you're something well, else in real life. I, I, but I have a different view. And I think what we talked about just now, in fact, is the Premier is always... Uh, acting. She's always doing that. I think with John Horgan, you see more genuine character and more mm -hmm. of the real person there. And some people may sure. not like it, that's fine. But I prefer it personally uh, to somebody who is just 
in my view, just acting through the whole thing. Well, you've heard it from the NDP, uh, from former NDP strategist. This is really John Horrigan. So this is what you're going to get. And so you have to put that face up and that brand up against Donald Trump, um, <clears throat> our other trade partners. Is that a man you think who can make it through a conversation with Donald Trump's mm -hmm. advisors without losing his mind? I don't think there'll be in a TV debate with him. No. We're going to introduce, Trade reintroduce debate. everyone for you if you're joining us now on F CBC Vancouver's live, Facebook Live post-debate analysis. Richard Zussman, our Legislative Bureau Chief, Bill Thielman, former NDP strategist, and Elise Mills, former Liberal strategist. And we want your comments. We have about 10, 15 minutes left for this. Any comments, questions, uh, insights that you had watching this debate. It was 90 minutes, a lot to take in, a lot of back and forth between everybody. We want that. We also want to give you an update on our Vote Compass, which is a set of questions, 30 questions you can do online, votecompass.cbc.ca. Have a look at it, dive in, and yes. There's new questions today, there too. There are new questions yep. today, in particular, around who may have won this debate, and we have new informal survey numbers. The numbers give us Christy Clark, 28%. Andrew Weaver, 35%. John Horgan, 38%. It's all go. pretty close. There we go. Yes, and don't forget about our live blog. You can join us now and log into that. Join the conversation. Send us those questions once again. Anybody surprised by those numbers? Not on a... Who did the poll? However many people did it. And yeah, does so it give us any... I mean, is it representative at all, do you think, Richard, given that you were in the room and listening to that? It's hard to judge winners and losers in these mm -hmm. debates. I think it's about how people feel when they walk away from the television set. And I think that sometimes takes well, time to yeah, formulate, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. You go to sleep yeah. tonight, mm -hmm. you think about it, you talk about it at the breakfast table with your family, you may go to work and chat about it. I think a debate like this touches a lot well, of people. And, and so you and think about it and then you sort of assess and, and then you get a sense of how and, you really and feel. And Richard, we, we, and Dan and Elise, we talked about zingers, which are always fun, mm -hmm. for sure. But it's usually some line or moment out of the debates, maybe from each of the leaders, that comes out more. And I think uh, John Horgan talked about the education piece again. To me, that was the memorable line mm -hmm. out of there, and he, he drove it home. And uh, we'll see what the other ones are. I'm not surprised that John Horgan, I, I, I said before, I heard the polling numbers, I said before I thought John Horgan clearly won, and, and I do, but uh, I'm, I'm biased, obviously, so people mm -hmm. take that for what it is. But I don't think anybody was knocked out of it at all. And I think mm -hmm. uh, for Andrew Weaver, just being there boosts him up. I mean, let's be honest, the third party, one seat in the legislature, he doesn't get a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. The polls have shown most people don't know who he is. Uh, they've seen him now, and they'll decide if that's the character mm -hmm. that they like to see as well. Elise? Yeah, I, I, I agree with both Richard and Bill. I don't think there was anybody that was knocked out of this by, by any means. This was, And this was very different from 2013, where yeah. mm -hmm. you were sort of like, come on, let's get going. Yeah. Um, but th this did appear to be more measured because of the heaviness of the, ins of the issues that are out there. I think they're very serious issues. And there is a turning point of where governments can go socially and economically here. Um, um, and the differences are quite stark, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but I think that, I, I hate to say this, I, and, I'm, and I am biased, I mean, I'm obviously a BC Liberal, mm -hmm. but I don't really love online polls, <laughs> and I don't really love them five minutes after a debate, because I think what Richard just talked about is that uh, serious voters are going to have a bit of a think. The, uh, things are gonna digest, marinate overnight. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm not surprised. They're all, they're all pretty close yeah. with each other, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and good mm -hmm. for Andrew Weaver. Yeah. I mean, this was a big moment yeah. for him tonight. Mm -hmm. He had nothing to lose, and he gained mm -hmm. so much, mm -hmm. I think. And we're gonna go really to, sorry, Richard, yeah. we're gonna go to one more question before we wrap it up. We have about two minutes left on our Facebook Live. Sean McInlay asks, is there a more clear winner in the debate based on performance in the panelist views? We'll wrap, the, we'll wrap it up with this. Bill, based on the panelist views, was there a clear winner? I know you're biased. Like no, you I, I mean, I, I, I would say so otherwise. No, John Harkin clearly won in my view. He delivered his message. He talked about affordability, talked about things he wanted to talk about, and he did it in a very, I think, very firm and, and yet polite fashion. Great. At least about 30 seconds. Um, my partisan hat, uh, because I like these policies and I like that leadership that Christy Clark has. She has real grit. I like that. And I, and I think she showed it off in the place that she is in her life as the premier mm -hmm. this time around. But in regards to the representing political clients and leaderships, I like where Andrew Weaver came from. He came from nothing. And this guy just came out. He wasn't going to let the last debate. Mm -hmm. Dis, uh, really brand him for who he was. He wasn't going to be a mug again. And so we went in there and that was it, <laughs> right? He did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he mugged it. <laughs> and Richard, we're going to go last to you. 
Do you think anybody's mind was changed after this? You've got about, can give us 15 seconds? Yes, probably. Mm -hmm. But one of the most interesting things I learned in there, and it's just an observation from the room, I talked to the two staff from the Green Party and they were thrilled. They said, Andrew delivered exactly on what he wanted to do tonight, and we'll see what the public thinks. Excellent. Thank you for joining us tonight on CBC Vancouver Facebook Live. Go to Vote Compass, join the conversation, and stay tuned to CBC. Thank you for joining us.